All right, so we've got some folks online, we've got some folks in person. Nine, 10, 11, 12. We'll give it a few minutes and see who else makes it. I don't want to start. Okay. Have I got Kathy? Okay. Um, Chantelle? Oops. Natalia? Here, I'm here. Sorry. I'm on Zoom. Yeah, I thought I saw your name. Taryn is on Zoom. David is on Zoom. Lindsay? Glenn. No. Oh, okay. Um, Alicia? I'm on Zoom. Yes, you emailed me. Monica? Also on Zoom, I believe. Yep. My goal is to learn people's names by the end of the term. This is a reasonable, what is it, smart, you know? Timely, measurable, achievable. <laughs> Not good at that. It, it'll be easier now that there's, you know, names, faces, and mirror neurons and stuff. Uh, Megan? Okay. Nicole? Okay. Jessica? Nope. Uh, Kate? Sophia? Jessica? <laughs> You're fine. <laughs> so that is everyone then. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, so we're going to start with case studies. Also, beware of the Ides of March. Doth, Brutus, Bootless, Neil, so on and so forth. Act three, scene one. Nobody cares. Cool. It's fine. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Someone appreciates. <laughs> cool. So I guess I need to plug that in, huh? I didn't have it turned on because I was monitoring the exam because I'm a creep. But I didn't want everyone else creeping. Wake up. Cool. Oh. There are no dumb questions, yes. Uh, Friday, 11.59 p.m. That is also when the answers will be posted. What's that? Cool. <laughs> yeah, I think they, it should show you what, when you get your score, it, sh it will tell you. You passed, I saw. And you're fine. You're fine. I already saw. Wake up. I have a question. Does it show our score? Oh. If that is the case, so I super hardcore nerd out and run analyses on all of the questions and any question that more like that is a standard deviation yeah. below what I think it should be will be thrown out because I didn't write the test and so I am I like math and I like statistics. It's not like why like it really follows the book pretty easily, but really long. Does anybody okay. who oh, I don't care. Oh, something's happening. Yeah. Doing a thing. Yeah, I thought she all the readings. She got through 
Sorry. Yes. You are going to be fine, I promise. Yeah, read the end of the chapters. The other two things that are really, really helpful, um, use the index of your book and the glossary of your book. They are there for a reason. So if you see a topic and you don't know where to look for it, save yourself the time, go to the index and look at the exact page number. Yeah. yeah. Does anybody that technology likes come and try pushing the exact same button that I pushed and see if it works for you? <laughs> I mean, you never know, it might. That would be glorious. HDMI laptop. What about like if I click that? <laughs> yeah. Usually these things like me. That was Blu ray, which I don't have. Yeah. Oh, it's all on. It's, you know, I checked all of that before. Friday night. You have, you can take it whenever you want to take it. There are some people who have extensions because of DAS accommodations. Yeah. Wake up. Yeah, I did make sure of that because at first it, the automatic setup is that you just go straight through and I'm like, oh, no, because if it was written, you'd be able to go back and flip and see all of that. Um, yes. All right, so we're going to attempt to talk about the case studies um, and let this thing think about whether or not, you know, maybe it's mad at whatever. Who's in the chat? <laughs> you know I like the idea of turning it all off and turning it all back on again. Boop, boop, boop. Well, the off button doesn't work. That's fun. I don't understand. Oh, nope. Take it out and blow on it. And... Cool. So, case studies. Vicky. Who remembers Vicky? It's on my screen. Can you read it from there? What is the number? <laughs> 21. Number 21, Vicky. Who remembers Vicky? Any thoughts? We will wait on those because I want to do the neurodevelopmental since those are the ones that are actually the midterm goes up through neurodevelopmentals, whereas it does not go through the substance use ones. So I'm not going to make you spend a bunch of time on those if you know, keep things fresh. It was an emailed request. And so, so Vicky. 35 year old clerk, mother of three small children, applied for treatment at a Montana mental health clinic with the complaint that my mind wanders. It's hard for me to keep my attention on one task and I get distracted so easily. Do you guys have these in front of you, kind of? Okay, cool. Then I don't need to. Aha. All right. <laughs> well, then I will read it. Um, she also described herself as disorganized, restless, irritable, bad tempered. She tended to overreact emotionally, was often depressed for days at a time. Her relationship with her longtime lover had begun to unravel. That's a fun sentence. Who wrote this? <laughs> the couple had frequent arguments, exaggerated by Vicky's temper. Her lover complained. Why does it, so why do they have to call it her lover, right? Like, why can't it be her partner or? You'll love this. I have a client that referred to someone as, um, she was trying to be really delicate and she's like this person that i sleep next to sometimes <laughs> and i was like huh <laughs> what do you do the rest of the time <laughs> and she just like turned really red and i'm like i'm your therapist like you can say what you want to say it's okay like we can break that wall 
Yeah. All right. So her lover complained that problems just never get solved. She also found it difficult to handle her two boys, whom she described as hyperactive. Psychiatrists asked the patient's mother to complete a questionnaire in which she was asked to recall Vicky's behavior as a child. The results placed Vicky in the 95th percentile of childhood hyperactivity, quote unquote. Although Vicky's memories of her own childhood were sketchy, she recalled being a disciplinary problem and often being sent to the principal's office in elementary school. She had no treatment as a child, but at age 20 and again at age 23, saw a counselor because she had difficulty, quote, coping, unquote. Her marriage, which had been very stormy, terminated after the birth of her third child at age 25, and she was again briefly in treatment. Finally, two years ago, she went to the community mental health clinic and was given antidepressant medication, which she took for several months without any noticeable improvement. What did people choose to diagnose Vicky with? Okay. Uh, did you choose a subtype? Yes, no. Okay. So there were multiple acceptable answers on this one. I went with ADHD combined presentation just because she, the scoring told us that she scored for hyperactivity. It was not clear if they did any testing for inattentiveness. However, she self reports feeling inattentive. Um, and so I went with the subtype, but, or the combined presentation, but any of them would have been acceptable. A couple other things that people put, um, somebody put disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. Um, someone else put intermittent explosive disorder. All of those are acceptable. Um, you know, clinically, I would probably want to treat the ADHD first and see if those other things go away because how much of that might be due to the irritability or the fatigue that's associated with ADHD or this idea of having poor coping. Um, so that one was a little, a little more cut and dry. We do the stuff now. You guys want to hear something really stupid? Yep, sure did. Hey, magic! Yay! Look at that. It's almost like it works, and it was user error. Surprise. Oh, why is this a funky size? Okay. Right. Because why not? So let's move on from Vicky and go down here to Cindy. Can everybody read that or does it need to be bigger? It needs to be bigger. Okay. Loud and clear. <laughs> that is fine. What is that? No, that's okay. <laughs> you know what? You're adults. I don't care. Just don't be disruptive. It's fine. We are talking about substance. No, we talked about substance use last week. So, Cindy, what did we think about Cindy? This one was kind of long. Hey, the brownies haven't kicked in yet, so you have no excuse to be distracted. What thoughts did folks have about Cindy? Okay. Look at that. Cool. Um, so that was also what I had put was the autism spectrum disorder. I put level two. Um, only because it does look like she is able to communicate in certain ways with the support that she has um, and the accompanying intellectual impairment, of course, because of the IQ scoring. Um, and then you could you know, also add the language impairments. Other acceptable answers were the intellectual disability, moderate or severe, um, language disorder, social communication disorder. There were some folks who wrote that they felt like because the language piece was so prevalent um, that they added it in addition to the autism spectrum disorder, all of that kind of stuff. A few other folks put stereotypic movement disorder, which was also acceptable. Um, as I was reading this, I thought that it fit more within the realm of autism spectrum disorder. However, you could make an argument that because her stereotypic movement is rising to the level of self-harm, um, it just wasn't 100% clear to me because it appears that she also does movements to self-soothe in addition to the head hitting and things like that. So it's not just one particular movement. 
but all of those were acceptable. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, Monica, age 13. I definitely did not write that one. Yeah. Yeah, this one, um, you would definitely need more information. And what I enjoyed about this is that the questions, the rollout questions and the additional um, just curiosity questions that people submitted, I thought were really, really great. Almost everybody submitted additional questions about this. So with the information we have, I mean, we see that she has a normal average IQ um, and we see that her grade point level, you know, her grade levels are pretty low for reading, spelling and math. And so for this one, it would be, you know, specific learning disability, comma, math, specific learning disability, comma, spelling, specific learning disability, comma, reading, um, specific learning disorder, rather. Um, whether you put moderate or severe, don't really know. That's where we would want to look at testing, and we would want to see what accommodations are actually being done, because it wasn't clear, you know, the way that they talked about this, um, it wasn't clear to me what sort of attention she was actually getting. Um, because is that, does this mean that the teacher is giving her lots of one-on-one -on -one attention or does this mean that she needs a wraparound? Does this mean that she needs to be in a totally separate classroom? We don't really have enough information here to say the severity. Um, so again, any of those would be acceptable. Uh, do, 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 do. And then, yeah, the other information is really just there is filler information, things that you might ask about, but that aren't necessarily, um, involved in the in the diagnosis except for like these things because if there was a global developmental delay then she would not have been walking talking and so on at, at normal ages so really the only thing here that stands out clinically is going to be these c scores and then this um, information up here andy andy was a complicated one Pretty much all of the answers I got were totally acceptable. So what did people choose? Okay, makes sense. I think my favorite comment that I got about that was somebody, uh, one of your peers in the Monday morning class said, does Andy have separation anxiety or does his mother have separation anxiety? <laughs> Which is a fair question. Yep, enuresis and, and capricious. So there, oh, gross. <laughs> lots of lots of different things here. So we don't know how long, um, because it says he had he had trouble the first couple of weeks at school. It doesn't specify a time period. Um, so separation anxiety probably true if we know that it's been more than four weeks. Um, and capricious, I listed as a rollout because it specifically says laxative use. So we also need to know more information around, is this happening outside of the laxative use? Um, to account for that, you could have put other specified elimination disorder with fecal symptoms, and then you could say due to laxative use or due to medical issue. Um, social anxiety disorder could be fitting. Again, we need more information. Adjustment disorder could be fitting, needing more information. Although it does say that he got better. We just don't know how long he got better. Um, so the only thing that we know for sure is the enuresis nocturnal, but any of any of these, and I mean, you all got 100%. So pretty much anything that fell within the realm of these issues is correct. Um, yeah. Anything that stood out about Andy or any additional diagnoses that you would want to add? You're making a face. <laughs> Okay, that's okay. It's a good thinking face. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I mean, obviously, what does this mean? You know, what is the illness that caused the impacted feces, the constipation, all that sort of stuff? Um, because for a kiddo to have those sorts of problems, that could be all kinds of different things. And so, you know, 
maybe it could also be if we had more information, you might even look at something like an illness anxiety. Um, we just don't know. So definitely need more information here about all the things. I was also wondering about like different like the amount of like things that like the expectations of the Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And that's the thing with something like social anxiety, for instance, this fear that others are judging you it doesn't specify whether or not it's a rational fear. You know, we tend to think of only diagnosing it as an irrational fear, but for a child that's having this issue where as occasionally happens, feces drop out of his pants, that's a rational fear that other kids are going to tease you and make fun of you. And so you could make an argument that, there, that that is a valid anxiety and it's still anxiety. So lots of, lots of different issues here. Yeah, definitely going to want to do some skills training with the parents, but the parents are not our clients, so that gets, uh, yeah. You know, you could try, um, but generally, you know, there's an entire family that is at my practice right now, and all, I see both of the children, except I've only actually met with one of the children because the others dealing with some troubles when it comes to attending appointments. Um, one of my colleagues sees the mom, one of my other colleagues sees the dad. <laughs> so those are really fun group su supervision sessions because we can kind of compare notes and say, okay, what are, the, what are the roots of the problem here? So yeah, it's definitely a thing. And it's useful because they all definitely are in need of some support and, you know, Children don't tell their kid parents everything and children don't know everything that's going on with their parents. So it's definitely useful to get all of those perspectives and be able to do some of that skills training for everyone involved. So let's talk about personality disorders. Oops. Um, we are going to again use the slides that go along with your book and kind of compare and contrast that with what it actually says in the DSM um, because I think that's fun. And because your book actually gets does pretty well with this particular section. Yeah, what do we have here? So your personality disorders are going to be organized into three clusters, A, B, and C, super descriptive names. What do you think these have in common such that they are clustered together? What did you read that they had in common such that they are clustered together? Because I know all of you did tons of reading the same week that you have midterms too. Because you have lots of free time. Close, yeah. <laughs> We're gonna skip that. So here are the words that are used to describe cluster A, cluster B, and cluster C. Um, so the odd or eccentric are your cluster A's, your dramatic, emotional, and erratic are cluster B's, and your anxious, fearful are your cluster C's. Lots of really problematic language there, right? Um, and we're gonna talk about that. So in the DSM, there is criteria for how to generally define a personality disorder. And they describe it as an enduring pattern of inner experience and behavior. So one of the things that a lot of people struggle with when diagnosing personality disorders is that they base it on the person's behavior only. And it's especially tempting to do that in settings where you are constantly measuring behavior. So things like group homes or institutional settings, um, incarcerated individuals, criminal justice, where you have lots of paperwork, that sort of stuff. And there's this sort of systemic failure to also learn about the person's inner experience. And that's going to be really key, and that's what I'm really going to emphasize as we as we talk about these. 
is not just looking at the behavior, but looking at the why of the behavior. Pattern is manifested in two or more of the following areas. So number one, cognition. So as usual, there's some sort of thoughts or thinking pattern happening here. Um, affectivity, so the range and intensity of the person's emotional experience. Interpersonal functioning, how much it affects their ability to function with other people. Not just things like work or school, unlike some of the other things. A lot of these are interpersonal because they are you know, personality disorders. And last but not least, impulse control, um, which even that can, has become kind of a point of contention in recent years when it comes to some of the specific diagnoses. So another problematic thing with diagnosis here is that the enduring pattern is inflexible and pervasive across a broad range of personal and social situations. So if you've been working with somebody who's been institutionalized their entire life, they're probably going to show traits consisted with several personality disorders. And if they've never been not institutionalized or if you've never seen them outside of that setting, it's important to be really um, hesitant with giving a diagnosis of a personality disorder because you don't know how much of it is maladaptive behavior due to the setting and how much of it is true and pervasive outside of that setting. Leads to clinically significant distress or impairments in social, occupational, other important areas of functioning. The pattern is stable and of long duration and its onset can be traced back to at least adolescence or early adulthood. Uh, this piece sometimes seems contradictory to people. We, it is best practice to not diagnose uh, personality disorders until a person is at least 18. And you often see traits earlier than that, right? We talk a lot with personality disorders about people having this sort of disposition that they're born with or a temperament that they're born with. And then based on other environmental factors, experience, traumas, um, attachment issues, all of those things might then develop a personality disorder. So you typically do see signs earlier than that, but because a person is still developing and things like impulse control and they're you know, held in the prefrontal cortex, yours isn't really done growing until you're around 25 or so for some people longer. Um, and so you want to be really careful to not overdiagnose in adolescence, especially in adolescence, because there's a lot of behavior that is considered normal and socially acceptable and part of growth for adolescents, especially early adolescents that might look like a personality disorder, but it goes away because they grow through it just like, you know, everyone else. All right. The, hey, something I didn't memorize. Um, egocentonic. So because it is a personality disorder and it is part of that person's personality, people will often feel like it is consistent with who they are as opposed to ego dystonic, right? Um, where it's, they might see it as this separate thing from them, you know, me and my cancer or me and my whatever, whereas with personality disorders, it's very much um, part of a person's identity. And it is part of how not only they see the world, but also how they see themselves. Generally poor prognosis. Um, your book says this a lot, and it says it about almost every single diagnosis in here. What that means is that it doesn't go away, right? It doesn't mean that it's not treatable. It doesn't mean that it doesn't get better. So if somebody has these embedded traits that are part of who they are, those traits probably aren't going to go away. However, in terms of prognosis, you know, we can frame that instead as with treatment, and with insight and with learning new skills, people can do really, really well. And there are a lot of people who do end up doing well, um, but a lot of the research is based on clinical samples, which by definition are not doing well, which is why they're there. And there, or say um, incarcerated samples, things like that. So again, we wanna be really careful with how we, how we frame these and how we are doing treatment because you will have a lot of people who feel really hopeless about things. Like, this is just who I am. It's like, no, and, there's treatment that can help you do better and feel better, even if the diagnosis itself doesn't change, even if these traits don't change. Kind versus degree. So we have categorical diagnoses, right? You have to have at least four out of the following 10 to be diagnosed with X. And just like with learning disabilities, you can diagnose people based on just your clinical impressions. And there's testing in, um, in addition to that. So I could give every single one of you an MMPI and you're all going to get different ratings on different types of empathy, for instance. 
And that will tell me something about that particular personality trait. That would be your dimensional model. Um, you don't, we don't do a ton of personality testing in clinical degrees because it's not always super useful. We don't even do a lot of it in, um, in forensic settings anymore, which is counterintuitive because you think that we would be. Although I, I did have a, a, a client once say to me, go ahead and give me an MMPI. I know how to fake it. I'm like, that's fine. Sure enough, in his cell, he's got the manual. And I'm like, really, anybody who's smart enough and knows how to read can, you know, do whatever they want with any test. So um, <laughs> whether or not that person was antisocial or just bored because he's been in a cell for 35 years, you know, up for debate. So there are dimensions to these. They, the, the personality testing can be useful if there are specific things that you are worried about or specific things, specific things that you want to learn more about for that person or treat for that person. And they're useful for research. That's the big one. It's really, really useful if we wanna see, does this treatment actually help? And if so, why? Which specific traits is it helping? In which case we need to actually measure that trait, measure that behavior, how that trait exhibits itself for the person and then go from there. But you don't need, you know, just like with the learning disorders, you don't need to do, you know, dimensional testing and whatnot to actually diagnose. So lots of different personality theories. Do you guys have a personality class in this program? Okay, a lot of psychology programs do. Anybody do want an undergrad? Okay, so you know then that there are lots of different theories of personality out there. These are the five that are considered to be universal across all cultures. Um, and, I posted on Canvas a list from MIT of over 600 possible personality traits that most of which fit into this. I did not read all 600 of them. I mean, I have at some point, like 10 years ago, um, and there are some that don't. In fact, I actually had to do a project in undergraduate where they had us take those lists and try to shove them into categories for the sake of seeing how difficult it is to shove things into categories. So when it comes to personality tests, especially those that you see in pop culture, these are used, um, a lot of these you probably recognize from things like Myers-Briggs or Enneagrams. Um, useful for understanding yourself, not super useful clinically. And lots of, um, they're, they're used, I shouldn't say not useful clinically, they're, they're used in some settings, things like um, industrial psychology, workplace psychology, that sort of stuff, but they are not validated for people with personality disorders. They are really only validated for, you know, you're worried well or AKA people that don't have any diagnoses. So great for learning about yourself, learning about, you know, relationship issues, those sorts of things, not something we use clinically. We do have personality. Oh, cool. Very cool. Next one. <laughs> so I was wondering if, if that uh, what you're saying is that um, the first year welfare interest is that fall into like an average welfare mm -hmm. of personality traits. Like, yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, yeah. So did you does anyone not know the definitions for these? It's okay if you don't, we can go through them. And these can be useful, you know, for other things too, like openness to experience, you might scale that, you know, opposed to things like rigidity or need for routine or um, comfort with novelty. And that might look like social anxiety, that might look like autism, it might look like a lot of other things. Conscientiousness is used in place of empathy because empathy is a um, very debated thing. Lots of people have natural empathy where they just feel the things that other people feel. Other people don't have that. Um, and so they have cognitive empathy based on principles or their sense of right and wrong. Um, some people have empathy based on very, very particular things. Like I can watch a surgery and I'm totally fine. As soon as a person makes any sort of sound like they're in pain, not fine, not cool. Um, other people, it's the other way around. They can watch like a gory horror movie and listen to people scream all day long and they're totally fine. But you show them like a medical thing where somebody is being hurt and they're not fine different types of empathy just based on the sensory pieces, what mirror neurons work for different people, all that kind of stuff. And so instead we talk about conscientiousness, which is this culturally bound idea of 
doing nice things for other people and how much you're able to think um, about other people's needs. Another term for this might be theory of mind, um, but we also don't use that very often because it is also um, pretty contentious. For example, the original studies about theory of mind were looking at three and four-year-olds and they would show them an object and say, what do you see? And they would have them you know, show something to a doll. And they would say, what does the doll see? And the kid would give them the wrong answer. And then the conclusion from that was, well, the child isn't capable of seeing it from the doll's perspective. 50 years later, they do the same experiment and they ask the children and the children say nothing because it's a doll. <laughs> and so the issue wasn't that they couldn't see from another perspective. The issue was that they, didn't, they weren't at that abstract enough level where they understood what was being asked of them. So we use conscientiousness instead. Uh, extroversion, just what it sounds like. Agreeableness, also pretty self-explanatory how much people are able to be flexible on one, you know, on one, in one way, how much people are rigid and then sort of on the other extreme, um, this kind of lack of um, identity that we'll talk about with some of the personality disorders where the person just sort of takes on others' personality traits because they are so agreeable that they aren't able to um, make up minds, make up their mind for themselves, that kind of thing. And neuroticism. Neuroticism, we talked about with some of the other disorders. This is a trait that you can measure, and it is things like whether or not the person can accurately assess negative versus positive outcomes. Um, if you give them a situation and they automatically assume the worst. So it could be seen as pessimism. It can also be um, it's related to control, how much that person has to have control over specific things, how much that person feels like um, they are already in control over different outcomes. All of those different types of things are wrapped up in neuroticism. Oh, we already talked about that. So interesting here. Prevalence of personality disorders affects about 10% of the general population. How many personality disorder diagnoses are there? Um, 10, right? Across three different categories or nine, it's 10, right? Yeah, okay. Um, and so what this doesn't tell us is, does that mean that 9% of the population is narcissistic and 1% is the rest? Is it evenly distributed? Um, don't really know because the research isn't clear. Again, most of the research has been done in institutionalized or, clin and, um, or clinical samples. So not a lot of great info out there. You can volunteer and take personality tests um, and contribute to the research if you are so inclined, but even then there's some sampling bias, right? Because we know that some people are more inclined to donate time to science than others. Um, and who knows what makes those people different than people who don't, lots of different ideas. Uh, we talked about this, may transition into a different personality disorder. Why do you think that is? Let me give you an example. If I have somebody who is really struggling with what appears to be borderline traits and behaviors, and we start doing DBT, and we get to the right versus effective skill, and they start using that to manipulate others or bully others. Um, antisocial people love DBT because it's all about how to be antisocial, um, how to be in complete control of oneself, which is great for folks that are struggling with really like high distress and who need those distress tolerance skills. Um, it's like the whole like seven habits of highly effective people. I've had a lot of inmates read it and then I read it and I was like, wow, this is really antisocial. <laughs> and so you might see how things that look like one thing then start to morph into something else. And it's not so much that that person is changing, it's because they're learning different skills and it turns out it was the other thing all along. And so again, we wanna speak to not, you know, not seeing personality traits as having to be this all or nothing thing and things that, you know, the behaviors can change as people learn how to cope with things differently. Another piece of it is that there is potentially an underlying etiology. So again, you have folks that have temperament issues that they're born with or develop in early childhood, and then something happens to them, some kind of trauma, illness, all sorts of different things. And then it turns into a personality disorder later on. 
And so it could be that because there are these underlying shared causes that you might also have these, um, these shared manifestations later on in life. So not a lot of detail there. The answer is really, we just don't know. Uh, gender distribution and gender bias. Lots of stuff to talk about here. We've talked about this before. Um, just how things manifest behaviorally based on how different genders are encouraged or allowed or not allowed to behave. Um, some of it could also be due to the different types of traumas that people experience, although that is also probably not a thing as we learn more. And as people, you know, talk about things more and share their experiences more often. Um, do, 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 do. Histrionic um, is one of my favorites because we still call it histrionic. Where does the word histrionic come from? Yes, what is hysteros? That is Latin for your uterus. You are crazy because you have a uterus. Cool. Um, and that was a thing up until, I mean, that's still a thing uh, for a lot of people. And so we may or may not see changes to that name. There have been arguments in the DSM committee that we should keep that name because it reminds people to think about those things and to have those discussions about why do we associate these particular behaviors, even though we see statistically that these particular behaviors and traits, you know, happen equally across genders. So lots of cool historical stuff there if you really want to nerd out. Uh, comorbidity. Why do you think that people, we talked about having multiple personalities, personality disorders, that was incorrect. Um, why do you think that there's a high comorbidity with things like mood disorders or anxiety disorders? Yeah, yeah. What does that feel like for people? Let's say somebody is, you know, dealing with a paranoid personality disorder. Chances are they're going to develop some anxiety, you know. Um, or let's say somebody has, you know, a cluster B disorder where there's this um, this big distress piece. There's a good chance that they might develop some sort of depression or bipolar along with that because what they're experiencing is so distressing. So there does tend to be this overlap there. Um, current personality disorders being research. So sadistic personality disorder is all about people who enjoy inflicting pain. Um, this would be separate from sadomasochism the way that it is described in the um, sexual disorders because this would be somebody who enjoys inflicting pain sort of broadly and not just um, as a sexual act. Passive aggressive personality disorder. This isn't something that I know a lot about. Has anyone read much about it? Anything interesting in the DSM? Yeah, it is an, it is an interesting term. Um, and we'll see, we'll see what that means clinically because a lot of the traits that people might be considered to be passive aggressive line up really well with some current diagnoses. Same slide over and over. Paranoid personality disorder. You don't see this diagnosed a lot. People tend to get overdiagnosed with something like schizophrenia. The difference is that this person doesn't have hallucinations and they don't necessarily have a formal thought disorder. So they're not having, um, you know, they're not having the actual perceptual disturbances. They're not seeing, hearing things that aren't there. What they could be doing, like people with schizophrenia might also have this issue where they experience like reference delusions or ideas of reference where they see something and they think it's about them, even though it's not. Um, but that's not, but the thing is actually there. The thing is real, the thing is concrete. You know, they're not hearing or seeing things that don't exist or that don't exist to others. Um, this is not the same as delusional disorder, again, because the beliefs are based on reality. There's a really fine line. Um, typically with delusional disorder, the person has a very specific delusional framework or thing that they are delusional about. Paranoid personality disorder is pervasive, right? So it's paranoia about all the things all the time. 
Um, a, one way to look at this would be a really sort of extreme manifestation of anxiety. So the actual diagnostic criteria suspects without sufficient basis. So there, again, there is basis, but it's not entirely you know, based on, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be um, perceived that way by others. That others are exploiting, harming, or deceiving him or her. Preoccupied with unjustified doubts about the loyalty of trustworthiness of friends or associates. Reluctant to confide in others because of unwarranted fear that the information will be used maliciously against him or her. Reads hidden or threatening meanings into benign remarks or events. Persistently bears grudges. Perceives attacks on his or her character or reputation that are not apparent to others and is quick to react angrily or to counterattack. Has recurrent suspicions without justification regarding fidelity of spouse or sexual partner. So four or more of those seven criteria. Almost like everything, everywhere, and just about them. Ex yep. But it's anxiety. Yep. Very close, absolutely. And there, there is quite a bit of overlap. Um, we're going to watch a video that talks about some of the subtypes of narcissism or narcissistic personality disorder. And one of them does look and sound a lot like paranoid personality disorder. And so that might be something where you do do some additional psychological testing to get an accurate diagnosis. But you don't have to necessarily because the treatment's going to be really similar. You're going to do a lot of CBT with this person. You're going to do a lot of reality testing. You're going to do a lot of distress tolerance skills all of those things, just like you would with the person that has narcissistic personality disorder. Um, folks tend to have a poor quality of life for obvious reasons. Um, things are tough if you're always feeling like things are out to get you or things are not going your way. One thing to be really, really mindful of is that um, the DSM does not speak to things like causality. So let's say a person has had um, some sort of experience where they were treated this way, they can still develop or they might still exhibit behaviors and describe an internal experience consistent with having a personality disorder. So it's also important to empathize with clients. Like, yes, you have this diagnosis. It's a reaction maybe or a result of this thing that you experienced, but I'm still gonna treat it the same way. So we're not talking about cause. We're not talking about fault here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And really any, any sort of trauma or abuse, um, people develop paranoia and they often develop it for some kind of reason. So there you go, early, early learning that people and the world are dangerous or deceptive and more common in people that have had experiences that make sense. Uh, you do want to be careful with some of these. For instance, um, I had an individual at the prison who was deaf and whose parents did not allow him to learn sign language when he was young. And when he did learn sign language, would often misperceive. He, he thought he could read lips. He did not read lips. Um, but when other people were speaking, he often thought that they were saying bad things about him, even if they weren't. And it wasn't totally clear. Um, there was disagreement whether or not this person was hallucinating others, you know, mouthing things about him or whether he was paranoid and he was um, misinterpreting people's mouth reading. Um, so lots of things to think about with those. Um, and, you know, other things too. If you are incarcerated, you might actually overhear staff talking about you and there might be other times where they're not talking about you, but because you're so used to having to be so hyper vigilant, you know, you might have that that ongoing paranoia. And so, again, you want to make sure that the paranoia is across all settings, across all domains, not just about you know specific things. Treatments. Um, obviously, you want this person to learn how to trust you. Makes sense. Not a lot of research. And uh, said this already, you're gonna do lots of CBT with this person to examine their automatic thoughts, examine their schema. Where did you develop these beliefs? Um, what do these beliefs actually mean for you? What need do these beliefs fill for you? All that CBT kind of stuff. Schizoid personality disorder. 
Um, this is one of those things that you will hear people refer to as, oh, they're so antisocial. Um, they don't mean antisocial. What they really mean is asocial. So this is a person who does not have the same social needs that are expected in their culture. Um, you might call it introversion. Maybe, maybe not. Um, introvert is one of those terms that gets thrown around a lot and usually incorrectly. There are lots of people who say that they're introverts, but then they spend all day like on social media. I'm like, you're not an introvert, you just have anxiety. Or you're not an introvert, you just prefer to interact that way instead of face-to-face. -face. Totally different. Um, this is a person who does not need any type of interaction whatsoever. And it's not like something with social anxiety where it is uncomfortable for them. It's just that they don't need it. So the way that this is defined in the DSM for more of the following, neither desires nor enjoys close relationships, including being part of a family, almost always chooses solitary activities, has little, if any, interest in having sexual experiences with another person, takes pleasure in few, if any, activities, lacks close friends or confidence other than first degree relatives, which is a little bit contradictory to criteria on A1, appears indifferent to the praise or criticism of others, shows emotional coldness, detachment, or flattened affectivity. So the way that schizoid personality disorder is defined is very much based on outside observations of behavior. There is a lot of diagnosis, um, comorbidity with autism spectrum, and one could argue that um, it's not always accurate because most people who are on the autism spectrum will tell you that they want to have interaction, but it's difficult for them in some reason, for many or for multiple reasons, whereas somebody with schizoid personality disorder simply is indifferent. Um, same thing with the, you know, the piece about emotional coldness, detachment, flattened affectivity. Most people with autism will tell you that they feel emotions very, very strongly, but the expression isn't always there, or it takes significant effort to engage in affective expression. Whereas this person, um, it doesn't actually say whether or not they feel emotions. It just says they show emotional coldness, detachment, or flattened affectivity. Again, not a lot of uh, research. There is some idea that children that are more shy are more likely to develop schizoid personality disorder, which makes sense. And some individuals may have experienced abuse or neglect in childhood, which also makes sense. Um, if you learn to be alone all the time, that is something that you are now okay with or more comfortable with. Um, we saw some of this with Harlow's monkeys. So we had Harlow's monkeys, right? And then a few years later, we took those baby monkeys and we gave them babies just to see what would happen. And lots of them had zero interest whatsoever in parenting the baby monkeys. And they had zero interest whatsoever in joining you know, monkey families when given the opportunity because they had been so terribly abused by Harlow and his grad students um, that they just no longer had a need. And it says that the crazy piece of neglect, I'm wondering if that could be just they're vulnerable because they're alone, they're vulnerable mm -hmm. because they're not going to be picked up like another kid. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, a lot of these things could very much be cyclical in that way. Like if a kid's alone all the time, they're going to end up experiencing more neglect, both from caregivers, from, from other children. Same thing with abuse. They're going to be more vulnerable. Um, so this is correlational. It should not be listed under causal because it's only a correlation. Um, very few people seek help on their own, which also makes sense. If you are okay with these things, um, you're not going to go get help. When people do seek out help, it's typically because it's causing problems in other areas. Maybe they're struggling at work, maybe they're struggling at school, and they're just not understanding why. And so the treatment then becomes all around teaching them skills. So teaching them how to express empathy, teaching them communication skills, all of that stuff to help them function better and to really get at the root of the problem. Is this person genuinely disinterested or are they struggling for another reason? Something like anxiety or something like autism spectrum.
schizotypal. So a lot of folks conceptualize schizotypal as being kind of a schizophrenia light. It's also a really interesting um, diagnosis because a lot of it just has to do what is considered to be normative cultural behavior. So the actual DSM traits, five or more of the following, ideas of reference, excluding delusions of reference, odd beliefs or magical thinking that influences behavior and is inconsistent with subcultural norms. For example, superstitiousness, belief in clairvoyance, telepathy, a sixth sense, bizarre fantasies or preoccupation. Yeah. So what do you consider? Note that it says subcultural norms and not cultural norms, because there are lots of subcultures that are into all of those things, and that is okay. Um, so take that as you will. Unusual perceptual experiences. So again, it doesn't say perceptual disturbances, including bodily illusions. Odd thinking and speech, for example, vague, circumstantial, metaphorical, over elaborative or stereotypes. Very similar there to what might look like a thought disorder manifesting. Suspiciousness or paranoid ideation. Inappropriate or constricted affect. Behavior or appearance that is odd, eccentric, or peculiar. Lack of close friends or confidence other than first degree relatives. Excessive social anxiety that does not diminish with familiarity and tends to be associated with paranoid fears rather than negative judgments about self. Criterion B, it does not occur exclusively during the course of schizophrenia. Bipolar depressive disorder with psychotic features, another psychotic disorder or autism spectrum disorder. So what does that actually mean? What might this look like? It's tricky, right? Um, Some of the behaviors could be more likely in the event in the book of him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, again, very similar to other diagnoses in that way, definitely an OCD component, especially if they're having some sort of obsessive thought process. Um, very similar to schizophrenia. So it's essentially schizophrenia, but it doesn't go over that threshold. Um, what makes this interesting, so the schizotypical, schizotypal personality disorder was added before schizophrenia was considered a spectrum disorder. <laughs> yeah. Now that we consider schizophrenia to be a spectrum disorder, it's a little bit redundant. The ways that you can really tell the difference um, are whether or not the person is having hallucinations. That's a big one. Do you see things that other people do not see? And that doesn't just mean like, yeah, I can see the patterns on the wall, but then somebody else gets really close. They too can see them. It's like, no, there's a cat over there, even though objectively there's not a cat, right? Um, and that can be troublesome with schizophrenia too, because a lot of people with schizophrenia who have hallucinations will describe hallucinations that are, um, they're seeing things that are there, but they're seeing things differently. So the little marks on the wall look like ants or the patterns on the floor kind of float or pop up a little or look differently to other people. Um, so even hallucinations becomes a difficult thing to measure concretely. Is it, is it true that auditory hallucinations are a bit more common than the visual? Depends on the person. Um, it's rare to have both. Most people have one or the other. One thing that differentiates schizophrenia is that if you ask them about the things they're hearing, they will tell you that it's outside their head. Yes. When people gain insight, they'll start saying, yeah, the voice is in my head because they've learned that the voices are originating in their head. But if you ask them to actually describe what they're hearing, it's a sound that is originating elsewhere. And we see that in the brain. We see parts of the brain. We see the auditory parts of the brain lighting up, as opposed to something like dissociative identity disorder, where the voices are very much internal. Um, but this person isn't hearing voices, right? They're not hearing clanging sounds, noises outside of their head. Because a lot of people with schizophrenia, it's not just voices, it's just other sounds. We'll describe things like 
um, buzzing or ticking or ringing or drumming, all sorts of other just really distressing type sounds. Um, so yeah, you would definitely kind of want to poke at a little bit and see whether or not this person is having hallucinations as opposed to just sort of misperceiving things. Yep. Yep. So you really want to get at this person's internal experience. Um, same thing with the magical thinking. So how much of that is cultural? And again, as we talked about, like with class one, um, you know, a diagnosis isn't necessarily that there's something wrong with a person. A diagnosis can also just be a way to categorize a person's experience. So you might say like, okay, this person's experience isn't normal for this culture. We're not, you know, we can give them this diagnosis because it's just describing what they're experiencing, not necessarily because it's a disorder, even though we call it a personality disorder, right? So there's lots of different ways to kind of frame these to really just fit your clients and to help them figure out what's going on for them. Presumably they're not coming to you for help unless it's causing some kind of problem. I lived in Africa for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's half of this country. Yeah, like, sure. that's a thing. If you laugh, but we have lots of people who yeah. have very strong beliefs about things like medicine or about things like gender. Um, all sorts of interesting beliefs out there. I have a really great. <laughs> Um, this is only vaguely related, but I'm really proud of them. So I want to share it. I have a 14 year old client who their last week of the week before did I talk to you guys about this kid. I'm so proud of him. Um, he was getting bullied at school and then there's a new girl at school that he started talking to. Um, and she started getting bullied and, um, they were bullying her about crappy things that kids bully kids about, like related to puberty and like hair and smells and all that stuff. And apparently these kids were going around saying that she is quote unquote slutty because she has an odor. And my client, bless his little heart, was like, no, -uh. anyone can have an odor. It's about their pH balance. It doesn't matter who you've been with. And I'm like, oh buddy, I'm so proud of you. Um, it was really precious because he was so serious. I'm like, you're right. You are totally right. Good for you. Good for you for knowing that. Yeah. But this idea though, that people's bodies are different based on things like their sexuality, that's a pervasive belief in our culture. Is that magical thinking or is it culturally based? We know that it's scientifically inaccurate. So would you consider that to be an odd belief? Um, lots of people have all kinds of different beliefs. Um, Somebody posted something online yesterday that was like, if you have more morning sickness, it means that it's a girl. And you're like, what are you talking about? So there's all kinds of beliefs that might be considered to be magical thinking by other cultures um, that are culturally bound here. We just don't think of them because unlike going to another continent, to another culture and seeing it as an outsider, um, we're just so used to it that we don't think of it as, as magical thinking or as unusual beliefs. Um, there are lots of people that are paranoid that their phone is listening to them. We will find out if that's true or not, right? Is that paranoia or is that accurate? Um, there are lots of people that have paranoia about like their, like, right? Like their Google Home listening to them could be accurate. We don't know. Um, and there are lots of people who are paranoid because they think that they've been maltreated by society in some way, even though objectively we know that they haven't. Is that paranoid or is that considered cultural? So lots of different ways that you could um, conceptualize what is actually culturally bound. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Um, you can really mess with people and just be like, oh, thank you, Thor. And people are like, what did you yeah. say? You know, just yeah. like something ridiculous and just yeah. kind of go with it and see, um, see what happens. Yeah, why not? So comorbid depression. 
why do you think somebody that we would call schizotypal personality disorder would have comorbid depression? I mean, you're probably sad because you're probably being bullied for being weird or whatever, right? Or people tell you you're weird or people tell you that you're not normal because you exist outside the parameters of what is considered to be culturally acceptable. Um, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so, you know, when I work with people that have this diagnosis, you know, I try really hard to help them find other people that have shared interests and shared spaces and magically the distress goes away once they find that acceptance. Um, and sometimes it does cause impairment to a level where things can get messy for them. So let's say their behavior is so odd that they're not able to function at work or it's inappropriate to people at work. Um, you know, you might have the person who thinks that the aluminum in their deodorant gives them cancer, so they stop wearing it. So then nobody wants to sit by them and someone has to have a really awkward and comfortable conversation with them. But again, it's not just one singular belief. You want to look at the whole person, whole personality pervasive across multiple domains. So if someone's coming to you for treatment, it's probably because it's causing some kind of problem in their life. And then you can look at it, you know, I can either accommodate them as with any personality disorder, really any diagnosis and help them figure out how to make it less distressing, or I can treat the underlying issues. If they have beliefs that are problematic or beliefs that are unsafe, then I'm probably gonna do some CBT and help them address those beliefs. Where do those beliefs come from? How can I reframe those beliefs? Antisocial. Um, I love working with antisocial people. They're so much fun. Um, let's see. Everyone probably has heard the phrase sociopath or psychopath before. We don't use those words anymore. Um, they are not really clinically meaningful, but everyone knows what you're talking about when you say one of those two things, right? So failure to conform to social norms with respect to lawful behaviors as indicated by repeatedly performing acts that are grounds or arrest. Deceitfulness, as indicated by repeated lying, use of aliasness, aliases, or conning others for personal profit or pleasure. Impulsivity or failure to plan ahead. Irritability and aggressiveness, as indicated by repeated physical fights or assaults. Reckless disregard for the safety of self or others. Consistent irresponsibility, as indicated by repeated failure to sustain consistent work behavior or honor financial obligations. Lack of remorse, as indicated by being indifferent to or rationalizing having hurt, mistreated, or stolen from another. Um, and there is evidence of a conduct disorder with onset before age 15. So that piece is really, really crucial because you want to rule out behavior that is based on things like need. Um, criteria on A1, you know, the respect to lawful behaviors, repeatedly performing acts that are grounds for arrest. That wording is very, very particular because in the DSM 4 TR, um, one of the criterion, a separate criterion was if the person has had multiple arrests um, and issues with the law. And this was during the drug wars. And we saw this huge sort of overdiagnosis of ASPD among people that were, you know, of different socioeconomic groups based on things like selling drugs to survive or engaging in sex work to survive and all of those things that were wrapped up you know when the dsm 4 tr was still being used so you saw this huge 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 issue with overdiagnosing, and there's lots of new research that shows that aspd exists at equal levels across groups it might manifest differently across groups um, so if you have somebody that experiences those traits they might be really, really good at things that are considered to be socially appropriate. You know, they might become really successful in certain types of careers that, you know, in which these traits would be useful. And um, when we talk about the impulsivity piece, it doesn't mean that the person is incapable of planning ahead. It's that they are 
more interested in what they're going to gain out of the thing and less about um, the adverse consequences. And we know this because the research shows that people don't think about the adverse consequences. They tend to overestimate the positive consequences or the gains that they're getting from it. Um, so it's not necessarily impulsive, like the same type of impulsivity we might see with ADHD, where you're like, ooh, cool, squirrel, shiny thing, whatever. Um, or where they're not able to hold on to a thought or an idea or an action for a long time, because there are people with ASPD that are able to plan out um, and engage in these sort of long-term cons. However, the, what's, what's that? My question is about mm -hmm. that too, but if you were to say like, like they're novel seeking, like they're yeah. seeking novel experiences. Yes. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, so for the folks on the computer, um, the comment was the impulsivity around seeking novel experiences. And there is actually a lot of research in that. And so they do mention in the DSM that you want to rule out something like schizophrenia or like some, if somebody only engages in this type of behavior when they're manic, for instance, because they lose that impulse control. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a fun graph. Tell me what's wrong with this graph. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Yeah. What else? <laughs> okay, yeah. One more, this is a big one. This is something that you should look for with all graphs. Look at the left. Well, that's what they're measuring. Yeah, it doesn't start at zero. And so you see this kind of exaggerated difference, you know. Um, and let's talk about looking at an incarcerated population and things like age differences. If I am looking specifically at behavior and I am measuring something like psychopathy and there are still, you still will see the word psychopathy used um, with specific testing. So there are psychopathy tests. Um, do you guys do any testing classes? Okay, I encourage all of you to do like a hair with your friends to see which of your friends are psychopaths because that's fun. Um, why not? No, that's one of the few that's still used in Oregon. Yeah, we we do them. Um, yeah, they are they have been done in mul several of the settings where it works. Yeah. <laughs> So age 16 to 20, we see a big difference between individuals that meet criteria for antisocial personality disorder and those that do not. And then that difference lessens and it continues to lessen as people get older. Why do you think that is? I mean, honestly, that's a big yeah, part of it. <laughs> you know, the thing that is interesting, so you'll notice that the folks that do not meet the criteria, it reverses at age 41 to 45. Um, the study was done again during a period when people of that age group were being arrested for a lot of things they might not be arrested for now. And so again, a lot of it is just what was happening socioculturally. When you have people being arrested for things like survival-based crimes, um, the drug war, so on and so forth, it makes sense. Less of those people are probably what we would actually consider to be antisocial, even though the rhetoric at the time was that these people are super criminals, you know, whatever that means. Um, and then the big jump makes sense because we are unlikely to diagnose somebody with antisocial personality disorder if they're 16 or 17. So you're going to see a different rate. All right. Um, makes sense that there would be an overlap with conduct disorder. We talked about conduct disorder two weeks ago, last week, one of those. Families with inconsistent parental discipline and support. What does that mean? Oh, 
So if I am a kiddo and I don't have consistent messages about what's right or wrong, if I get in trouble for something one day, but the next day is acceptable, or if I don't know what my expectations are, it makes sense that I'm not going to learn normative social behaviors, right? Um, you also see this a lot. Let's say there's an abuse situation in the family, or let's say maybe one of the parents has a substance use issue and a kid learns things like, sometimes I get beat for this, sometimes I don't. Am I actually in trouble? Is it actually wrong? And how does a child differentiate that? But in addition to that learned behavior, there is also the temperament piece. Um, a lot of folks will describe these early childhood type behaviors and temperaments where there is a lack of empathy. Um, you know, this is the kid that like tortures the baby brother just for funsies, all that sort of stuff. Histories of criminal and violent behavior makes sense. And as we've said already, even though it used to be thought to be, used to be thought, whatever, um, to be a reliable predictor of criminality, it is not so much. We do know that it can be a reliable predictor of recidivism. So for people who are already committing a crime or have already committed a crime or already committing crimes, um, if they score highly on something like the hair or another psychopathy test, you will find that it can predict their likelihood of committing another crime. And the reason for that is because their antisocial personality traits have just happened to manifest themselves as criminal type behaviors. Whereas for other people, not necessarily. So it's one of those like, if all A's are B's, but not all B's are C's, which of the C's are A's kind of thought. Mm -hmm. Yep. That is exactly what it is. Um, so for the folks online, one of the comments was that, it, you know, it is consistent with folks that have experienced inconsistent attachments. So lots of research has been done on folks with antisocial personality disorder. This first one is the under arousal hypothesis. This is what Glenn was talking about um, in terms of seeking out novel experiences. So cortical arousal is too low. This is a person who does not respond to stimuli the same way that others do. Um, if you're looking at something like polyvagal theory, you would say that this person's uh, vagus system is kind of under baseline. It takes more to excite them. It takes more to agitate them, although they could be quick to anger, but the quick to anger is usually based on not getting something that the person feels like they need or want in that moment. Um, but there tends to be this, uh, or the idea is that there's lower activation in general. And so people seek out experiences that are activating or that are exciting in some way. The research on all of these is mixed because the research is often based on either incarcerated samples um, and or older criteria. So there's not a 100% overlap with say a psychological test that looks at psychopathy and the current criteria for antisocial personality disorder because we like to keep things really convoluted and complicated for various reasons. Yeah, to overcompensate. Absolutely. Um, and there's also a look at um, the dopamine pathway, the same areas that are involved in addiction where the person might engage in behaviors that increase arousal over time and those behaviors get more extreme over time. Uh, the cortical immaturity hypothesis. So this is exactly what it sounds like. The person's cerebral cortex, specifically the prefrontal cortex, appears to not be fully developed. Um, so the parts of the brain that respond to things like impulse control. Um, fearlessness hypothesis, failure to respond to danger cues. So we put you in an fMRI, we show you pictures of scary things. This goes along with the under arousal piece, but it is specifically to things that could be a threat or could be dangerous. 
And then the Gray's model, um, all of these are kind of connected where the inhibition signals are outweighed by reward signals. So the dopamine pathway, the prefrontal cortex, all of those things that would normally tell you that something is not right or that there's some kind of danger or you shouldn't do the thing because bad things will happen. Um, for some people, those things are still there, but their reward signals are a little bit stronger than others. Um, all of these are again, hypotheses. The research is there, the imaging is there, and it's for people that have already been diagnosed. So we don't know, it's like a chicken or an egg thing. We know that as you use different neural pathways, they become stronger and others prune out, right? And so it's not totally clear which came first, if there's something wrong with this person's brain, or I should say something different with this person's brain that causes them to act a certain way, or if their behavior, their environment, or both, causes changes in the brain that then causes additional changes in their behavior and or environments and so on and so forth. So again, correlational. Um, the first of these studies was done, the first of these types of studies were done um, post-mortem. So that's not super helpful. I know what a dead psychopath's brain looks like compared to a dead other person's brain. Cool. That's how we first learned about the issues with schizophrenia is, all right, you're dead. I'm gonna cut you open and see what's happening in there. Now we have things like fMRIs, so that's nice. Mm -hmm. um, but we're still comparing specific samples, so it is problematic. Um, the only way to really know would be, you know, to do something like Harlow and take some monkeys and do some stuff in their brain and see how they act. And we don't do that because it's unethical um, and mean. <laughs> and if you do that to children, you're probably going to go to prison, or you should. Um, yeah, so. Lots of interesting brain stuff here. There's also a lot of um, behavioral research that's been done. Folks have pro are probably familiar with the original research done at the FBI. Yeah, no, okay. Um, there, so when the behavioral health unit and this idea of doing psychological profiling still like really originated, um, the folks that wrote it, or the folks that were involved in that essentially tried to create this entire um, like analysis paradigm. So you probably heard about this trifecta, oh, somebody wets the bed and they were abused and they hurt animals, it means they're a psychopath. Um, that's where that came from. Not true. We don't know any sort of link between enuresis and antisocial personality disorder. But that was being th those that research was done specifically on uh, sexually violent people that ended up being profiled by the FBI. So a very specific sample. The research is still really valuable, really useful. Um, I have a copy of their questionnaire I can bring in if people want to look at it. You can find it online. It's like twenty bucks or something, or you can look at mine for free. Um, it's interesting stuff, and they did lots and lots of research on this particular group of people. And again, because it's a very specific sample, we don't want to necessarily extrapolate it to the rest of the general population or even extrapolate it to other types of crimes, right? So what's happening in the antisocial brain of a person who is a really amazing CEO or a televangelist might be different than what's happening in the antisocial brain of a person who tortures kittens. We don't know. It might be the same. So lots of research being done there and lots of research that still needs to be done. Did you ever watch the show Mind? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So pretty, yeah, pretty much a dramatization of that particular yeah. unit. I have to say, I don't know any new things. Uh, new things, things that are fun and new and exciting. Oh, yeah, let's do a class. Yeah. So folks, and, and you see this again, like with the manic phase where people will um, seek out new stimulating things. Um, like I've never stolen a car before. Okay, cool, that was fun. Now I'm gonna go steal a BMW, sweet. Now I'm gonna go steal a Lamborghini. Okay, cool, now I'm gonna go steal a plane. So it kind of escalates because the thing that used to be fun stops being fun. So you want the newer, bigger, better thing, right? Yeah, and lots of people have that trait. It doesn't mean that they have antisocial personality disorder. Lots of people just like novel experiences, but there's a spectrum, right? So genetic influences. Um, again, how much of that is actually genetic? Note that there is not a comment on heritability here. So we're not looking necessarily at variants. 
how much of that is environmental versus how much of that is actually genetic. With most personality disorders, there is thought that there's a stronger genetic influence because temperament um, traits at birth, traits during infanthood um, tend to be genetic because you're new to the world. And we're also learning that things like in utero experiences and epigenetics affect people. So how much of that is truly genetic and how much of that is environmental and whether or not it's a false dichotomy between the two is still up for debate. Uh, we talked about most of these already. Yeah, uh, if your kid sets things on fire, tell them that's bad, right? Mm -hmm. Makes sense. And always tell them it's bad. Don't tell them it's bad sometimes and good other times because that's the whole inconsistent parenting thing. Don't give them candy for setting things on fire. Um, right? And probably the worst like forensic clinician ever because every person I meet, um, one of my favorite ways of building rapport is I'll say, oh, what are, what are you know, your charges here are murder. And then I say, well, did they deserve it? And they're like, and it's a great way to get people talking because they don't expect that question. Um, and, you know, it's just interesting. And it tells you a lot about the person because if they truly think they deserved it, like that's, that's something to look at. Uh, we already talked about all this. Oh yeah, I love forensics. I'm taking a break right now and doing trauma work. Somehow that's a break. Um, the thing is that when you're in forensics, everyone also has a history of trauma. Being incarcerated is traumatic. So even for somebody who's really, really antisocial, they can still experience PTSD type symptoms. And so it's like, you know, we're gonna get out of the prison for a little bit. We're gonna get out of the forensic state hospital for a little bit and work with people before they end up there, you know. All right, we already talked about this. And again, few seek treatment on their own because if people don't feel like they're doing things that are wrong, they're not going to seek treatment. So you see a lot of um, involuntary treatment settings where people are court mandated treatment and that sort of stuff. Antisocial behavior as opposed to antisocial personality disorder is predictive of a poor prognosis. So like I said, there could be lots of people who meet the criteria for the personality disorder, but they might not engage in criminal behavior. So they have a better prognosis. Maybe they end up really, really super successful because their, you know, their traits are manifesting in ways that are socially acceptable or really lucrative. Um, you're gonna do a lot of preventative work. And a lot of times the work is gonna be around um, what the book calls selfish, but what you might also consider to be practical things like, hey, do you wanna to go to prison? No, okay, then we're not gonna do the thing. And you wanna be careful because there are some people who do wanna to go to prison. I have a former client who purposely did a thing to go to prison because he was old and homeless and didn't wanna die on the street. So you really want to figure out what motivates that individual and help them work toward that goal in ways that are safe for themselves and safe for others. That's where the DBT thing gets interesting because it's again, right versus effective. Do you want to effectively meet your goal or do you just want to do the thing because it feels good? Okay, take a break. 10 minutes. Okay, right, so yesterday was Pi Day, today's the Ides of March, so I am on a roll. I'm great. Let's pause this. Let's give our online folks a moment to return. Looks like everyone's around. Okay. We are going to move on to borderline personality disorder, which is talked about a lot and not super well understood. <laughs> I don't, but I am intrigued as to the uh, connection. I was just telling you about Okay. I feel like it helps me learn a lot about the disorder, but I don't know if it's, I feel like you'd be like, I don't know. I honestly have no idea. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the name's a little off-putting. 
Yeah. And that's the joke about yeah, it. it's meant like, to be sort of ironic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah totally. <laughs> so what sort of things um, come up for you when you hear borderline personality disorder? What sort of things have you heard at jobs, internships, and in media? What do you think? What, what are your initial reactions? Yeah. Um, and so my hope today is to kind of um, dispel some of that because it can be really difficult to work with at times, but I don't know that it's more difficult than other things. Um, one of the things that people struggle with, and this is true for all personality disorders, is that it often feels very, very personal um, to the clinician. And so as with any other diagnosis, you want to be really, really careful to kind of disconnect from that and at the same time, still be able to engage in some kind of co-regulation with the person. So it is, it can be tricky. Well, let's look at the actual criteria. So pervasive pattern of instability of interpersonal relationships, self-image and affects. Marked impulsivity, beginning in early adulthood, present in a variety of contexts, indicated by five or more of the following. Number one, frantic efforts to avoid real or imagined abandonment. A two, a pattern of unstable and intense interpersonal relationships characterized by alternating between extremes of idealization and devaluation. Number three, identity disturbance, markedly and persistently unstable self-image or sense of self. Impulsivity in at least two areas that are potentially self-damaging, things like spending, sex, substance abuse, reckless driving, binge eating. Number five, recurrent suicidal behavior, gestures, threats, or self-mutilating behavior. Affective instability due to marked reactivity of mood. For example, intense episodic dysphoria, irritability or anxiety, usually lasting a few hours, only rarely more than a few days chronic feelings of emptiness, inappropriate intense anger or difficulty controlling anger. For example, frequent displays of temper, constant anger, recurrent physical fights, and transient stress-related paranoid ideation or severe dissociative symptoms. So again, we're kind of seeing this overactivation and underactivation, but it's happening very, very quickly. So you hear a lot of people, like I have a client right now that is convinced that his caregiver, who isn't actually his caregiver, is bipolar because she has mood swings. Um, the irony is that I'm 99% sure that I'm going to be diagnosing my client with borderline personality disorder. <laughs> but he, you know, but there is this myth, right? That person has mood swings, therefore they're bipolar. But we already know that bipolar is long lasting episodes. Whereas with borderline personality, you're seeing these very transient stress-related experiences. Um, person's really, really up, person is really, really down. And all of these criteria tend to be related. So, you know, when a person is experiencing that really intense idealization of others, that's when they're really, really up. When they start to experience that really intense devaluing of others, that's when they tend to get really, really down. That's when you tend to see um, the impulsivity, the fear of abandonment, all that kind of stuff. So, do, 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 do. very high comorbidity with depression and a high comorbidity with bipolar disorder. Um, borderline personality disorder is the second highest um, related to suicide outside uh, or the second highest related to death, I should say, outside of um, eating disorders. And there's also a high comorbidity there because of that sort of need for self-harm, self-punishment. Um, the intense devaluing, idealizing tends to also be applied to the self. And that's where that unstable self-image comes from. Um, so the person not only sees other people as really up or really down, but they tend to see themselves that way too. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, a lot of times those internal experiences can manifest in ways that are not safe. And that's true for any diagnosis, right? Um, and so it's really important again here, as with things like narcissistic personality, antisocial, et cetera, to really focus on the internal experience, not just the behaviors. So there's a difference, for instance, um, between let's say somebody is threatening to kill themselves because they don't want you to leave. The difference between say somebody that has BPD and an abuse tactic is that the person who has BPD genuinely feels that way in the moment, right? Um, they're trying to get, that's their way of coping with that distress and they are genuinely so distressed that they really do feel like they will die if you leave. Is that still a, an unsafe behavior? Absolutely right? Is that a healthy relationship? Probably not. But the difference between that and say what you might consider to be an abuse tactic is if it's purely an abuse tactic, the person doesn't actually want to kill themselves. They're saying it for the sole purpose of control. And it could be both, right? You might have people who have a personality disorder who also maladaptively learn those types of behaviors to avoid things like abandonment. Um, but with borderline, it's important to remember that there is very, very genuine distress. So it's not just based on their behavior, it's their internal experience as well. So we do tend to see borderline overdiagnosed um, because of that behavioral components. And again, there are a lot of settings that um, have a propensity toward these types of behavior. So in prison, for instance, if you want to get a single cell and you want to get into special housing, you go cut yourself, you get into SMH, bam, boom, done happens a lot. People who do it repeatedly end up with a borderline personality disorder diagnosis, even though they're doing that behavior for a different mean, it's not necessarily because of genuine distress. And there are people who do it because they are so terrified of being in general population that they do it to get the special housing. Is it true self-harm or is it, you know, self-injurious behavior as a means to an end? So there's a lot of nuance there. And you really want to tease apart how distressed is that person? Are they, hurt, are they hurting themselves because they feel like they deserve to be hurt or they're self engaging in self-punishment? All of those sorts of questions. You really want to explore the internal experience for that person. Uh, strong genetic components. A lot of this is because of the temperament, um, the high reactivity, issues with the limbic system, lots of trauma stuff. And a lot of it could also be the issues that come along with parenting. So like you said, if you have a parent that is struggling with something like borderline personality disorder, their kids might develop similar type issues because that is what they are used to. That has become normative behavior for them, or it's the only way they have of getting their needs met. High levels of shame, low self-esteem, um, which has a lot to do with that link with uh, depression. One thing that's interesting about BPD is that starting in the early 90s, um, when Marsha Linehan developed DBT and all that, she was really the first person to propose that, yes, there's this genetic component, and it doesn't just have to be trauma or abuse. It can also be things like she really focused on having what she called an invalidating childhood experience. So that could also be things like really authoritarian type of parenting um, or you know, all of those other situations, not just parenting, but all of those other situations where the person is not seen or heard. And so they develop these maladaptive behaviors based on temperament traits. The person has really high distress and their only way of getting their need met is through some of these other maladaptive behaviors. Yeah, yeah. Or things that, you know, we might consider neglect, but other people consider to be normative for some reason. Um, there is a lot of cross-cultural stuff here too. Um, we see BPD overdiagnosed in women, underdiagnosed in men, uh, cisgender folks. We see BPD really overdiagnosed in transgender folks, which makes sense if you think about validation and the cultural issues at play there. We see BPD overdiagnosed in Latino populations, um, which is thought to just be different cultures express emotion differently. And for people that express emotion more, you know, strongly than others, we're going to call that BPD, even though culturally it's normal. So there's a lot of nuance that you want to take into account before diagnosing somebody. Um, 
and again, you know, you've all seen this in your workplace, when somebody gets something like a BPD diagnosis, it really follows them and it really affects how people perceive them. So you want to be careful. The triple vulnerability model of anxiety applies to borderline personality as well. So this is that kind of cyclical type thing that folks were talking about earlier. The person already has some sort of temperament, biological vulnerability is how Linehan put it. And biological could mean genetic, biological could mean limbic system, it could mean biological responses to trauma, all of that stuff. And then because of that, they also have the psychological vulnerability. So they don't have the skills or the ability to handle the high distress. And then that makes things more stressful, increases the distress. So it's kind of this ongoing cycle there. There's also a higher vulnerability when it comes to experiencing abuse as well as um, engaging in behaviors that could be abusive. And so you see these ongoing cycles of invalidation that then lead to increased behavior, increased distress, so on and so forth. And all of those are kind of linked together. So that's what we mean when we talk about the triple vulnerability. Treatment options. Um, this is no longer accurate because there is a lot of research now and there's a lot of research that people can have really good outcomes, particularly with dialectical behavioral therapy. Um, I do DBT with almost everybody because it's useful. DBT is really, have you guys done any DBT yet? Okay, a couple of yeses, couple, couple of noes, mostly noes. Um, DBT is really just teaching people things that they should have already been taught, but weren't for some reason, as well as helping them relearn abilities that they have unlearned. So things like mindfulness, for instance, everybody is born. Well, that's not true. Um, if people have like epigenetic trauma, things like that, but most people are born with the ability to engage in mindfulness, the ability to engage in sensory type experiences. You know, like if you watch a two-year-old at the park, they're going to pick up every little rock and they're going to examine it. And they're going to really engage with the texture, you know, the feel of it, all of those things that we associate with mindfulness. And people lose that over time. People with trauma especially lose that. They lose touch with their bodies. They lose touch with their nervous system. So the mindfulness module is really focused on getting people back in touch with those things, learning how to identify distress, um, and then learning how to cope with it. The other piece is the dialectic. So when you're dealing with somebody that has really low self-esteem and this really intense sense of shame, that feeds into itself. And so the dialectic becomes learning to accept oneself as you are and needing to change. The dialectic is also about engaging in the sort of dual reality. So instead of seeing things as all good or all bad, black and white thinking, we call it, you might help a person understand like, yes, you love this person and sometimes they mistreat you or yes, um, you know, this person left you and that doesn't mean that you're a bad person or yes, you engaged in this behavior that was hurtful to someone and you're still trying to get better. Like these things that seem like they're opposites, but you really want to help the person learn to live in those spaces of ambiguity. And so the, the focus is less on uh, not so much gray areas, but experiencing multiple things at the same time and being able to experience that nuance. Distress tolerance um, makes sense. So you want to increase the ability to deal with distress and not cope with it maladaptively. And then interpersonal effectiveness, teaching the person how to communicate in ways that aren't going to be hurtful to others, teaching them to get their needs met in ways that don't rely on maladaptive type of behaviors. So with DBT, now that it's been 30 some years, there's lots of research and it is shown to be extremely effective. So the person might still meet criteria based on their internal experience, but over time you do see really, really strong behavior change. Um, and you see this across different populations. So we see this in incarcerated groups. We see this with groups that experience trauma. Um, we've seen DBT adapted for IDGD populations. All sorts of research has been done and it is pretty promising. So uh, at the time of publishing, maybe not so much, but you know, the research has been there and you can go on to like Linehan's websites. You can go on to the DBT Institute website. You can open up JSTOR and look up all the studies yourself, but it is there. So 
When we say there aren't a lot of good outcome studies, yes, the person might still experience some of the personality traits, but you can absolutely treat the behavior and treat that person's ability to cope with their own internal experience. Uh, we're gonna watch a video because we have time to. Yay, we have time to watch the video. That's your attendance grade, so I'm not sharing anything that I shouldn't be because that would be awkward for everyone. Good. I was like, oh shit, exam scores. Nope, 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 nope. <laughs> no, I closed, I made a point to close that window. <laughs> yeah, I thought about it. I was like, you know. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. This video is a little like warm, fuzzy, touchy feely, which obviously isn't really my study, but I think it's useful because it helps kind of understand the internal experience of what people go through. Whoa, that's not. That's hey, Psych2Goers. Ah. Did you click on this video because you have a friend who has borderline personality disorder or BPD? Or maybe you've been diagnosed with BPD. Mental health professionals. Est what did you say? <laughs> you know, that's not what I was thinking, but I had a thought about the voice, so. It sounds, um, it sounds what? that's more along the line I was thinking like it sounds like somebody that I should be paying for the minute to talk to me <laughs> approximately 1.6 percent of the population what <laughs> good for them meets the criteria for borderline personality disorder so chances are you have at least one friend with BPD unfortunately the symptoms and behaviors associated with BPD, such as manipulation, self harm, and emotions like an intense roller coaster, can make staying friends difficult. Have you ever asked yourself why your friend with BPD does the things they do? This video breaks down four things your friend with borderline personality disorder wants you to know, but doesn't know how to tell you. One, their thoughts and feelings work differently than yours. Although anyone can go through a low point in their lives, People who don't have BPT have difficulty understanding what their friends with BPT might be going through. One minute the world is perfect and they feel untouchable. The next minute, however, it can all come crashing down after they feel triggered. The individual with BPD has difficulty regulating emotion and understanding the shades of gray that normally help people without BPT put things into context. It can be frustrating, draining, and downright heartbreaking to watch someone you care about on a roller coaster of emotion, especially if it seems to happen a lot. But have you ever asked yourself why this happens? Emotionally speaking, individuals diagnosed with BPD experience the world as if they're missing at least one layer of skin. This creates a constant feeling of emotional hypersensitivity and rawness. People diagnosed with BPD often say that they feel empty, worthless, or numb. At the core of this is often an intense fear of rejection, abandonment, and loneliness. These deep, intense feelings and difficulty with context often distort the thoughts of someone with BPD, steering them towards self-harm and negative self-talk. Unfortunately, these tendencies towards self-destructive behavior and negative self-talk often get the person with BPD labeled as manipulative or attention-seeking. What your friend with BPD wants you to know is, two, it's not all about attention or getting their way. Common symptoms of BPD include unstable moods and identity, risky behaviors, deep fears of abandonment and rejection, and a tendency towards suicidal thinking and gestures. These symptoms are often used to explain the behaviors most commonly associated with BPD, such as needing constant validation from others, threatening suicide, giving ultimatums, and emotional reactions that seem too intense or overboard. It can seem like no matter how much you're there for your friend with BPT, you can never do enough to make them see it. In addition to discouraging, this can feel like you're trying to fill up a Grand Canyon with a small spoon. But those behaviors you find clingy, manipulative, or attention-seeking aren't what they appear. Oftentimes, individuals diagnosed with BPD fear rejection and abandonment because they've experienced a lot of rejection and abandonment in their lives. Until individuals with BPD learn the coping and social skills they need to successfully work through these deep-seated fears, they use the negative behaviors as a way to get their needs met. This kicks off the following self-fulfilling, self-destructive cycle. First, something happens, like a breakup, an argument with a friend, not getting the recognition they want at work or school. 
That triggers the individual with BPD's deepest fears. Second, this activates a barrage of angry or negative self-talk, which creates a lot of anxiety and depression for your friend with BPD. Third, because your friend does not have the emotional skin to cope with their internal stress, the depression and anxiety can make them feel like they're being swallowed whole by it. Fourth, they act out in whatever way they know how, often via manipulation, erratic behavior, blowing up, self-harm, or issuing threats. And lastly, their loved ones often pull away, which creates more self-hate, depression, and anxiety in your friend who has been diagnosed with BPD. Their fears get triggered again. The cycle often repeats itself in your friend's life, which can lead to increased feelings of loneliness, abandonment, and rejection. So how do you deal with a friend struggling with BPD? Watching your friend struggle can make you feel helpless or quite... So, uh, we're going to skip the rest because it's um, about people with friends, right? But what I like about this video is that it's all about learning about a person's internal experience. And so I do want to make it clear, um, because someone who emailed me about it yesterday, when we talk about things like manipulative behavior or unsafe behavior, um, we're talking about it as clinicians, right? We're not talking about it as somebody who has a family member or who's in a relationship. Um, and so, you know, I just want to be clear, like we're not justifying this type of behavior, but we're trying to explain it because as a clinician, it is your job to stick around and help that person with that behavior. Whereas as a friend or as a partner, you know, the boundaries might be different. So when it comes to boundaries and again, with personality disorders in general, the boundaries need to be firm and also compassionate. Um, true with BPD, especially so with BPD because it has so much stigma, but also true for things like narcissistic personality disorder, histrionic, all of those things. Um, and a lot of times it's just sitting with the person while they deal with that distress. Uh, do you have any other questions about BPD? Anything, thoughts, comments, concerns? Cool. Ah, oops. All right, histrionic personality disorder. So, interesting stuff here. This is also not something that we see diagnosed a lot um, for a couple different reasons. Again, because people don't necessarily seek help and, and also because there might be di you know, diagnoses that are conceptualized differently or diagnosed as something else. Um, so the actual DSM criteria, one, so five or more of the following, uncomfortable in situations in which he or she is not the center of attention. Interactions with others is often characterized by inappropriate, sexually seductive or provocative behavior. Displays rapidly shifting and shallow expression of emotions. Consistently uses physical appearance to draw attention to self has a style of speech that is excessively impressionistic and lacking in detail, shows self-dramatization, theatricality, exaggerated expression of emotion, is suggestible, in other words, easily influenced by others or circumstances, and considers relationships to be more intimate than they actually are. So we have a really big range here. Um, what does it sound like to you? in terms of things like attachment or trauma. Yeah, so definitely some insecure attachment stuff here. Could be anxious attachment, definitely. And remember, attachment styles aren't diagnoses, but they can be used to explain, they might manifest themselves with these different diagnoses. Um, histrionic personality disorder also looks, um, in the real world, it looks a lot like what we might consider to be fawning type behavior. So as we, you know, and that's, a term that you've probably seen kind of become more um, popular and more common in the mental health world. This idea that there's a fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. Um, but this would be particularly interpersonal fawning. So the suggestibility and the lack of understanding of boundaries, this belief that people are closer to them than they actually are, a lot of that is vulnerability, right? And not being able to really perceive safety, what's safe and what isn't. Do -do -do -do. 
there's also a big overlap um, with other diagnoses. So one thing that is interesting with histrionic is that unlike a lot of the other personality disorders, it does not say that it's not happening exclusively during say a manic episode or um, a schizophrenia episode or DID or something else. Um, and so you wouldn't necessarily rule it out. You could use this diagnosis to describe things. So you might, you might even add a, um, you know, a qualifier. So person, you know, has PTSD symptoms and histriotic personality disorder traits. You could say um, bipolar one, most recent episode manic with histrionic behaviors. If they're engaging in this type of behavior when manic, you know, and so on and so forth. So you can kind of combine diagnoses that way. And it could just be a thing all on its own. You also wanna be careful and make sure that you're not diagnosing this based purely off of different cultural things, okay? You're nodding knowingly, I wanna know. <laughs> well, no, I just, I see a lot of pictures of you. So, yeah. So I tell my students when they get a little bit older, I'm like, I mean, they would fit into more so the stuff of maybe some of the responses that maybe had it that way. Yeah, and how old are your, what grades? Yeah, I mean, this sounds a lot like normal junior high kids. Yeah, same as personality types in general. Absolutely. And that's- What does it look like for guys? That's how much of that you yeah, so that's the interesting part, right? What do we consider to be sexually provocative? What do we consider to be overly dramatic? What do we consider to be inappropriate? Um, to me, it is about um, an inability to read social situations, okay? So let's get real serious here for a minute. Um, had a kiddo who would attempt to engage in sex acts after experiencing some intense sexual trauma because that was their way of attempting to gain control over relationships. So you've got this eight-year-old who walks in and says, who's in charge so that I can, you know, whatever. That would be considered sexually provocative. Walking into a room and announcing that you are going to perform oral sex on whoever is in charge, that's sexually provocative, you know? Really black and white there. Age inappropriate due to trauma. And again, we're not saying that this isn't due to trauma. We're just describing. What would this look like in an adult though? And how do you, you know, how do you measure something like sexual productivity in different contexts or with different sexualities? So again, when you're diagnosing a personality disorder, you want to really, really be careful that this behavior and the, this internal experience is happening across domains. So they're not just this way at school. They're not just this way when they're around other teenagers because teenagers are disgusting, <laughs> right? Like they are horny, they are gross, whatever. Um, yeah, they just, they don't know. They're figuring it out. They're learning their own boundaries. They're learning each other's boundaries. New things are happening. They're having all kinds of uncomfortable feelings and they don't know. They're exploring ways of dressing. They're exploring ways of expressing their sexuality. And so what you want to look at is, is, is it inappropriate for the context? Is it inappropriate for the type of relationship? Like, is this a professional relationship versus an interpersonal relationship? Um, what this might look like in men is a lot of flirtatiousness um, in ways that are, again, not appropriate to the relationship that you have with that person. What we consider to be sexually provocative would also be um, culturally bound. So we all know that it's okay for men to wear things, that it's not okay for women to wear things, you know, free the nipple and all that jazz, right? So what you consider would be sexually provocative would be inappropriate for the setting. So if you are at your clinic and somebody walks in with like their, you know, onesie sling thing on like Borat, that's probably not appropriate. If you're on the beach, depends on the beach, right? Um, so you wanna make sure, is this contextual? Uh, the dramatic and sensational piece is really just what it sounds like, what might have been previously called hysterical, which leads us back to that whole gender bias thing. The impulsive and need to be the center of attention. Um, a lot of that comes down to the person 
not knowing how to get their needs met without what we would consider to be maladaptive types of attention. So in a lot of ways, this can be contrasted with something like borderline, where when the person who has borderline personality disorder is in need of validation or attention, they will act out in very negative ways or ways that um, get negative types of attention, like making threats or hurting themselves, whereas this person kind of does the other extreme where they act out in these really intense fawning behaviors. They act overly affectionate in ways, again, that are inappropriate based on the level of relationship um, very sexual, all of that kind of stuff. Um, thinking and emotions are perceived as shallow. That is not one of the DSM criteria. The DSM criteria is, or criterion, is the, um, has a style of speech that is excessively impressionistic and lacking in detail. So a lot of this comes down to identity. Um, this person doesn't have a very strong sense of identity, and so they will take on um, aspects from other people, which again, junior high, that's what kids do. That's normal. So we're probably not going to diagnose this in a junior high kid for doing normal junior high kid stuff. Now, if they're 30 and they're still doing this, that's questionable, right? It's concerning. Um, or if they're 50 or 60 and still doing this, probably concerning. Uh, do, do, do. And then the other piece that's really important is that considers relationships to be more intimate than they are. So a five-year-old goes on a playground, five minutes later, they come up to you with another five-year-old and like, hey, mom, this is my new best friend. Totally normal, right? Not so normal for an adult. And there's overlap there, right? There's overlap like folks that have borderline personality disorder. They're going to have that really intense, really fast idealization of a person. You know, they might meet somebody in a week later, like, oh, I'm so in love, I love my life, blah, blah, blah. And then the week later, they're awful and I can't, you know, all of that ups and downs. Similar here, except that it's all about intimacy. So the person might talk to, um, I got a client today who I have never met this person, um, was referred to me by a colleague. The colleague is seeing he and his partner for a couples therapy. He shows up 40 minutes late, fine, not a big deal. So I'm thinking, okay, we have 20 minutes. We're going to get your paperwork. I need to like get you in the system. He sits down and immediately starts telling me about his erectile dysfunction. And I'm like, cool. <laughs> like really, really personal thing to just share with someone the first time you're meeting them. Um, and it was, it was odd. It told me something about where's this guy at, right? Why it's obviously a problem that's on his mind. And I don't even know your name. <laughs> I know your first name, but we just met. And yes, I'm a clinician. So sure, it's going to be appropriate to talk about those things. But why is that the first thing we're talking about? You know, so this in this lack of awareness about um, the level of intimacy, um, things like that. And again, as a clinician, people might be like, oh, I can tell this person anything, but most people still have an understanding, or at least they have an appropriate level of guardedness. You know, their first appointment, they're going to talk, talk to you about things that are currently stressing them out. We're not going to get into that deep trauma for another month or two. And if they do, that tells me something about their lack of boundaries. It tells me that here's a person that feels like everyone else is entitled to their story. Here's a person that hasn't had good boundaries. Here's a person who's been abused because they don't know that I'm not just automatically entitled to these really deeply intimate parts of their life. So lots of different manifestations there. More histrionic. Um, has thought to be a feminine variation of antisocial traits, kind of problematic there. And a lot of that, again, comes down to what we consider to be socially appropriate behavior. So there is this history of people who engage in, say, survival sex or sex work getting this diagnosis and getting diagnosis antisocial because it's not considered to be a sexually appropriate or a socially appropriate behavior in our culture. Lots of stuff there that we could unpack. Um, it is probably out of the scope of a DSM-5 class. But you can kind of pick it apart that way and think about why would this be considered antisocial? Um, I tend to see most personality disorders as a manifestation of trauma, but that's also because I come from a trauma lens. So you might perceive this as antisocial, you know, no judgment there. Uh, do, 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 do. So treatment options. Um, I'm gonna focus on safety with this person more than anything else. 
Like, okay, you're putting yourself out there in ways that are not safe for you. What are we going to do about that? How are we going to keep you safe? How are we going to keep you from getting too emotionally intimate with people that, you know, might be targeting people who are overly emotionally intimate, right? Because we know that vulnerable people tend to attract predatory people. How am I going to keep you from becoming predatory yourself in some way or another? How am I going to keep you safe? Um, how are we going to learn to read social cues? What's considered appropriate for a first meeting versus what's not? All of that stuff. I also want to add that like it was 11 o'clock this morning. I'm like, why are you talking to me about your ED at 11 a.m.? Like, why are you thinking about your ED at 11 a.m.? Like, I'm thinking about lunch. Um, but like, just that like that lack of awareness that like, this is not a thing. This is not the first thing. This is not, hi, my name is blank and I have ED. Like, okay not a normal boundary. We're going to wait till like the second or the third meeting where we start talking about that. Fine, but not the first thing that you say, because that's an over familiarity, you know. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Narcissistic personality disorders is another one of my favorites. Um, <laughs> mostly because it is really, really misunderstood and overused. So Every single person who has been mean to you in your life is not a narcissist, despite what Instagram says, okay? Every single one of your, every single exes is not a narcissist, <laughs> you know? But that's what we're taught, right? That's what we see in the media. That's what we see all over the place. 10 signs, your partner is a narcissist. Like, no, that's not, that's not how that works. First of all, the DSM only gives you eight criteria. So at least two of those 10 are completely made up. Um, and second of all, you can't diagnose people that way. Right. So just like with any other personality disorder, it's certainly true that lots of people might have these traits. It does not mean they have a personality disorder. Or let's say there is a person who's really, really abusive, but they only express these traits or behaviors in interpersonal relationships, but they don't express them or you don't see it in other contexts, not a personality disorder. Um, that person's just an asshole. Big difference. Yeah. Sort of helps maybe understand. Uh, well, absolutely. Yeah. And I say that with, you know, compassion for that, because if you have been victimized or if you are a survivor of some kind of abuse, it's really nice to be able to conceptualize what is wrong with that person. And we also know that when people have been abused, they want to empathize with their abuser, which also isn't great. Um, and so there's this kind of automatic, like, why did this person treat me this way? Oh, they must be a narcissist. So really, really common, but also really problematic because you don't want to over empathize with your abuser because that just adds to all of the shame and the guilt and all that stuff. You also don't want to try to diagnose them because not everybody who's a jerk is mentally ill. That's also a really problematic way to look at mental illness, right? If I think that everyone who's an asshole has a personality disorder, not great. So let's talk about what narcissistic personality disorder actually is. Wouldn't it be right? <laughs> I have <laughs> right, yeah, it, it would be great. Um, I have a client and I've only met with them twice, so I haven't formed a diagnosis yet. And um, this individual comes in because he has marital problems. I want you all to do the math here. He's 31 years old, he's divorcing someone he was married to for 10 years. He has five children with five different women. <laughs> why am I getting divorced? And I'm like, why do you think? <laughs> and of course, the first marriage is the first person. Yes. First marriage. Yes. Of marriage. And my first question is, are you monogamous or are you poly? Nope. <laughs> well. Let's tease this apart a little bit. Why do you think your wife is leaving you? And why did it take four other children? Like, what's going on? Lots to unpack there. Um, and again, not just interpersonal. So we start talking about work. What's going on at work? Why, why can't you keep a job? It's always someone else's fault. I got fired at this job because my boss was a jerk. I left the last job because they didn't appreciate how smart I am. You know, I, I left the job before that because I wasn't getting paid enough. Like there's this constant sort of externalization. And so I'm like, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna explore this more and might be looking at an MPD type situation here just based on those little red flags that pop up. So we don't know yet. Um, diagnostic criteria. 
five or more of the following, and again, present in a variety of contexts. So grandiose sense of self-importance, um, exaggerating achievements and talents, expects to be recognized as superior without the commensurate achievements. Um, again, internal experience. This isn't a person who's lying about their achievements because they are getting some kind of secondary gain. This is a person who genuinely believes that they should get credit for things, even if it doesn't quite match up with their actual credentials or their actual experiences. Um, you know, I'm a genius. Okay, cool. Let's, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, like you've done intelligence testing and stuff. Oh, no, 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 no. Like, oh, okay. Or maybe they have, and even though we all know that intelligence testing is really problematic and not super accurate, but maybe they have and they're not a genius, so not even close, but they very genuinely believe that. And then if you bring up something like intelligence testing, they'll tell you why it's wrong. Because it's, again, that internal experience, of true belief um, of grandiosity or self-importance here. Uh, preoccupied with fantasies of unlimited success, power, brilliance, beauty, or ideal love doesn't just have to be those. Um, those are the things that are in the DSM because culturally those are the things that we consider to be successful, but it would really be whatever is considered to be successful for that person's culture. Um, like I'm learning about with, with my client, fatherhood is really, really important to him. And he hasn't seen like three out of those five kids. And, you know, I kind of picked at that a little. Again, I've only met this person a couple of times. Why haven't, you know, why haven't you been able to, to see your kids? Oh, because the mom is crazy or this mom is a bitch or this or that or that, you know, it's always externalized, but I'm a great dad. Okay, when was the last time that you, you know, tried to initiate one of those visits? Oh, never, because I don't want to deal with that. Cool. Interesting. So there's going to be an inconsistency there between how that person perceives themselves versus their actual behavior or their actual history. Um, believes that he or she is special and unique and can only be understood by or should associate with other special or high status people or institutions. Um, this can also manifest as pe um, less around accomplishments, the way that we measure them. You might see this with people that have a really extensive history of trauma, but who feel like their trauma is much worse than other people's to the extent that I'm so crazy, I'll only meet with the head of psychiatry or I'm so whacked, none of you can help me. And so there's this almost sort of grandiose or inflated sense of self that sure, it matches their experience. They've absolutely had trauma and they're inflating um, things that we don't consider be successful, but for that person meets some kind of need or to that person, that is how they define themselves. And it's just not, it doesn't match you know, the objective reality. Like hmm. You can add that to the list. Yes. <laughs> Somebody should start like a Google Doc of like, you know, in, in my, D yeah. <laughs> yeah. In my DSM-5 class, the summer class, one of their assignments is actually to pick a character and try to diagnose them just to see, you know, what do they come up with? Class, yeah. Yeah, like make it fun. Oh, okay, okay, that's different. Make a case study. Yeah, I don't want to read about that. Want to... Yeah, please don't. Yeah, you know, everybody's got issues, but I don't want to know about them. That would be an example of a boundary, you know. Um, tell your therapist about your daddy issues, not your professor. I, it's not my business. It's weird. Okay. Yeah. So it was useful in some ways. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, that's fine. There are actually some programs that require counseling, so it could. Okay, cool, whatever. You know, those are conversations I have with my clinical social work students because there are six of them and I have them for a year and it's more, you know, kind of a mentorship kind of thing, as opposed to a class of, you know, two sections with 36, you know, boundaries, right? Different boundaries, different contexts, different situations. Like, 
one of them FaceTimes me because they have an interview and they're freaking out, we're going to talk about it. If one of you FaceTimes me, I'm like, why? Like, <laughs> we don't have that relationship, right? It's a bigger class. It's not as intimate. And we're not talking about things. But I mean, we're not talking about things like countertransference. We're not talking about things like how your own traumas are affecting your work with this specific client. So a lot of it, again, is just context. Um, I mean, you can, <laughs> whether or not I answer is going to depend on a number of factors, um, but it wouldn't be, you know, it's out of context, right? Yeah. Like I have a client that just sent me a meme. I told her, you might use some memes all day long. I think it's hilarious. And we're going to talk about them during your session. I'm not going to text you back at, you know, 830 on a Tuesday. We'll talk about it. Fine. You want to be added to the doc? You can, oh yeah, oh yeah, definitely, 100%. I might really expect that. No, that's good. Honestly, I think it's brilliant. So, <laughs> let's move on for the sake of time. I'm glad we can laugh because this is heavy stuff and you need to be able to laugh about heavy stuff. We've lost all of our online friends. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, so the additional criteria in the DSM requires excessive admiration, makes sense, and has a sense of entitlement, meaning unreasonable expectations of especially favorable treatment or automatic compliance with his or her expectations. So if I go to a Michelin star restaurant, my expectations are going to be different than at McDonald's, right? So it's all about context. Um, yeah, when we talk about entitlement, this is another one of those things that can be really difficult in clinical settings because you might hear people be like, oh, that patient's so entitled, but the patient's asking for something like coffee, right? Mm -hmm. Things that normal people want to have or things that they don't get to have. And so it, does, it might feel like a special privilege for them. But that's not the same as being having unreasonable expectations um, or especially favorable treatment. You also want to pay attention that if people are trying to get favorable treatment or um, engage in that kind of behavior, that it isn't some kind of trauma response, that they're not trying to get closer because that makes them feel safe. And as usual, somebody might have a history of trauma and still have narcissistic personality disorder. Interpersonally exploitative. So takes advantage of others, excuse me, to achieve his or her own ends. Lacks empathy. This is interesting wording. This is one of the only times you're going to see this in the DSM is unwilling to recognize or identify with the feelings or needs and needs of others. So it doesn't say unable, right? The implication being that here, this person's brain maybe perceives others' needs just like everyone else's. I mean, we don't know. There hasn't been a ton of research on it. The wording here is specifically unwilling. So they might know how other people are feeling. They might be able to accurately assess other, other people's emotions. They might have a perfectly intact theory of mind. Um, it's more that they just don't care or are indifferent to it or use it in some way to be exploitative to meet their own needs. Is often envious of others or believes that others are envious of him or her. Uh, shows arrogant, haughty behaviors or attitudes. However, you want to define that. So, failure to learn empathy. A lot of this can be learned, right? So they have the empathy, but they don't learn how to actually care about it or express it in ways that are considered to be socially appropriate. Um, here's an outdated fun thing. Um, product of the me generation. What does that mean? <laughs> You know, I, I read this and I was like, this is fascinating to me because I work with a huge range of people. And I tell you what, the kids are so much nicer. <laughs> like they are really conscientious. They really care about things. I mean, you still have your bullies and you still have like your, you know, your little douchebag 12 year olds that like throw rocks at each other or whatever, but like, they're really nice <laughs> comparatively. Um, and so I don't know how old the textbook writers are, but they might have some biases that they need to like figure out. Uh, yeah. And I also don't know if that's research-based because lots of things that might appear like narcissism. So things like taking selfies, for instance, people think that that's narcissistic. It's not always narcissistic. For some people, it might be. 
For other people, it's a way of documenting. Um, one could argue that taking a selfie is probably less narcissistic than sitting for eight hours a day for 30 days while some Renaissance person paints your portrait. What's the difference? Um, other than one everyone can afford and the other people can't. So how much of that is actually generational or cultural and how much of that is just how we perceive different manifestations of what you know we consider to be the same thing? Um, is blogging any different than journaling? Did, did the people who journaled things in the 12th century do it because they thought it was historically significant or did they do it because it was narcissistic? And if you believe one thing, why do you believe something different about the current generation? So there's a lot of nuances here that you really wanna think about, right? Like what's the difference between somebody who documents something on Instagram all day versus somebody who literally you know, spends 14 hours a day documenting their life a few hundred years ago? And for what purpose? So again, you really want to look at the internal experience and not just the behavior. Um, you might have somebody who that is their way of expressing their narcissistic traits, but for someone else, it just might be a totally normative piece of that culture, right? We don't wanna automatically go, oh, they're narcissists because of the kids these days. We wanna look at the internal experience. Why are they engaging in that behavior? What need does it fill for them? Um, and how does it affect their view of their self? How does it affect their, um, their self-conception, their identity. Uh, treatments. A lot of treatment is going to be around, again, CBT, DBT. Um, sometimes IFS can be helpful here, especially if you're dealing with subtypes that are more vulnerable. So in the example of the client who is extremely, extremely traumatized, but feels the need to constantly say, I'm so crazy, none of you people can help me. You know, at one point I actually was like, then why do you keep coming? You're telling me that you are so sick that no one in the world except the best experts ever are helpful and yet you're here. Why are you here? And it really took him a second to come up with that. He didn't have an answer and like made a joke instead. And the joke was, oh, because Liz told me I have to. I'm like, no, I don't. You can show up or not show up anytime you want. Like this is your choice. Um, the same person, and this, and this is really sad, the same person um, repeats the trauma story over and over and over and over and over again, but isn't really interested in learning coping skills for it, isn't open to or able to yet learn coping skills for it, really just wants to be heard, but the story sort of changes and the story becomes more embellished over time. And so that would be an example of a type of narcissism that doesn't necessarily manifest the typical way. Um, there are other behaviors that go along with this too. Like the caregiver isn't a caregiver. The caregiver is a friend that he has convinced to drive him everywhere all the time for free. <laughs> because damn it, he's not riding the bus with those crazy people. But wait a minute, you said you're crazy. So there's a mismatch there, right? Um, the crazy, which is not a word that I would use to describe a client, this is a word the client says about himself, is very much seen as this kind of grandiose, unique, special thing about the self. Um, and less about, because this person also is doing okay. Like functioning, um, not having any PTSD symptoms, just wants to come and tell you about it. Okay, fine, cool. Uh, so treatment there, a lot of the treatment is helping that person figure out what their goals are, right? Why are you here? What do you want to get better at? How can your life be better? And how can I help you figure out that your life is better without externalizing um, and without engaging in this really black and white, um, everyone else's problem? And I can still change. I can still do things that would be better. So lots of stuff you can do with Narcissistic personality disorder. Uh -huh. Would you say that this is something that in certain settings is celebrated to bring up as something wonderful? Like, I'm thinking oh, yeah. of the abuse in the first place. Very much like what you're looking for. Like, this could end up positive. Oh, yeah. You should run for office. <laughs> I mean, I saw where you were going with that. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. I mean, this might get me fired, but I was chosen by God to lead all of you. 
okay. Why do you know that? Well, he cal- he came to me. Okay. Did you literally hallucinate this? No, I just knew it. I just knew it deep down. Okay. In our culture, that is socially acceptable. And we do celebrate people. Okay. You know, go across the hall, get your degree or whatever, and then you can be a leader. And you have to differentiate too between how much of that is a true desire, because there are people who genuinely believe that they are special and they are chosen, but then there are people who are there because they want to help and they want to be of service to the community. And there's a difference. How much of it is I want to be of service to my community and I'm hoping that I can be, or I'm hoping I can learn to be versus I am just a sort of naturally superior, I am chosen, I am special in some way. Absolutely. And there's also still some nuance, right? There are people who end up in helping professions because they have this narcissism where they feel like they are superior in some way. And a lot of it comes down to where does that come from? How do they view themselves? How do they view others? Am I helping these people because I'm better than them? Or I think that I um, have abilities that they don't. Or I think that I'm smarter than them. You know, you kind of have to really tease out that internal experience, not just the behavior. And you'll find that really in any career. Um, and it's a hard balance, right? There's a big bat, like you see this, um, like I have a friend who is an artist and is really struggling with this concept right now of like, I feel narcissistic if I advertise my art. I feel narcissistic if I tell people they should pay me, you know? And I'm like, you know, I had that trouble too. Like when I started private practice, it felt weird. It felt gross to me to learn about marketing for trauma, right? Like that felt weird and icky and uncomfortable. And like, how do you make a living, right? So you have to be able to balance those things. But there's a difference between that and say, probably get in trouble for this too. The person who doesn't want to go to grad school like all of you are and takes like a six month online course and becomes a life coach because they think that they have some sort of like deep wisdom and insights that none of you have and they're going to make it all better for you, you know? Big difference. One is open and willing to learn. The other kind of thinks they already have it all figured out. So a lot of it, again, is just that internal experience. How does the person view themselves and how does the person view themselves relative to others? Oh no, did I hurt your feelings? I'm sorry. Did I say something bad? And that's not true. I I should also emphasize, like that's not true for everybody who goes into coaching because there are lots of people who go into coaching because grad school is inaccessible and expensive Mm -hmm. and it takes privilege Mm -hmm. of certain types. And again, how do they view themselves? How do they view other people? Those internal experiences, not just the behaviors. I think two approaches are often kind of working with people that are healthy and helping them move through the transition. Yeah. Whereas we're looking at more pathological issues. Yeah. You know, so the worried well. Different focus, but yeah, it's like we were just saying, what? Two years? We wasted two years. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, I could charge how much to do what? <laughs> you know, it's a thought. I <laughs> noticed that. Yes, like, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You must think that you're special. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. And and we see this with a lot of personality disorder diagnoses, but they are very much weaponized. Right. You're just feeling that way because you're BPD or you just think that because you're narcissistic. And so again, we really want to focus on the internal experience and not just that person's behavior. There might be behavior that lines up perfectly with, you know, the the diagnoses criteria, and you go to talk to the person and they are feeling totally different, you know, they're do- or they're doing it for a secondary gain. Again, you see this a lot in institutionalized settings, um, hospitals, people that have been incarcerated, people that have a long history of trauma, attachment, all of that stuff. So you want to be, you know, just really careful. And I think a lot of personality disorders, like, uh, like you know, aspects, like you were talking about the caring, caring. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yep. And we see this even now, like in Oregon, we have the ACT model, the assertive community treatment model. Um, and, and this isn't necessarily because there's something wrong with the model itself, but it is considered to be contraindicated specifically with borderline personality disorder because they are a crisis team and they want to make sure that only people who are having real crises call them. The reason for that is because they are really there to specialize in um, like psychotic type events. And there have been times where I've had clients that carry both schizophrenia, schizoaffective, you know, some kind of psychotic disorder and a borderline diagnosis. And they say, no, they don't qualify for ACT services because they have a borderline diagnosis. And I'm like, okay, what if they kill themselves and you didn't show up? That's a thing. So a lot of it is, it gets really convoluted that way. Same thing in our Department of Corrections system, your mental health diagnosis, not your presentation, not your functioning, but purely your diagnosis rates you as an MH0, one, two, or three. Threes go to special housing. Threes are things like schizophrenia, bipolar, what we consider to be SPMI. Twos are things like um, personality disorders or um, certain types of depressive disorders. That's concerning because if you have somebody who is consistently engaging in a self-harm behavior or something like that, and they're rated a two, that determines how often they get to see their counselor. It determines how often they get to see their psychiatrist. It determines what unit they get to live in, all of those things. So it can be, and at the same time, from the perspective of the institution, you know, you might have limited resources and you have to figure out what to treat and what kind of treatment to do. So it's really kind of a no win in an ideal world where we had unlimited resources, that wouldn't be the case. Like for DBT, for instance, full fidelity DBT includes group, individual, and on call. Because the idea is that if this person is distressed, they should have access to someone who is going to help them through the distress. And yeah, that's also used as a measure. If that person is utilizing the on-call system, are they using it less over time as they move through the program? Because you're going to learn that you're going to use that to learn whether or not that person is better able to independently handle the distress. That's something like ACT. Um, ACT is considered first-line treatment for folks that don't do well in other types of treatment. So they haven't done well in outpatient. Maybe they're not able to get to appointments. Maybe they're homeless. Maybe they are actively psychotic. Um, but because someone along the way decided this is contraindicated to borderline personality disorder, it automatically excludes people now. And that's problematic for a lot of reasons. So yeah, no worries, long convoluted. Sorry, I'm not good at answering questions concisely. Um, <laughs> avoidant personality disorder. This is going to look a lot like attachment issues. It's also going to look a lot like schizoid personality disorder, and you might list both, except differences here. Um, instead of being completely indifferent, so the behavior looks the same, the internal experience is different. Avoids occupational activities that involve significant interpersonal contact because of fears of criticism, disapproval, or rejection. Also looks a lot like social anxiety. Unwilling to get involved with people unless certain of being liked. Shows restraints within intimate relationships because of the fear of being shamed or ridiculed. Is preoccupied with being criticized or rejected with social situations. Inhibited in new interpersonal situations because of, feeling of feelings of inadequacy. Views self as socially inept, personally unappealing or inferior to others is usually reluctant to take personal risks or to engage in any new activities because they may prove embarrassing. So this is a person, if we think of like histrionic as having no boundaries, no walls, this is a person who has boundaries and walls that are maybe a little too strong to the point where it affects their ability to have relationships, even though they might want to. So what is the difference between those criteria and say social anxiety disorder? Any ideas? It's tired or you're tired and it's late. Okay. So social anxiety disorder, you know, we went over this when we did the anxiety disorders. It tends to be specific situations. Um, avoidant personality disorder is global. 
So all relationships, all the time, family, friends, romantic, all of those things, professional. Um, yeah. This is also a person who they might be in relationships, but they have difficulty connecting because of that fear. So again, you're going to look at those attachment issues here. You're going to look at the person, you know, the kiddo that has that avoidant attachment style. Um, this is a person who, so let's say, you know, I have the client who comes in at 11 a.m. and starts the conversation by telling me about his erectile dysfunction. This would be a client who it's their sixth session and they're still just sitting there. And I'm like, what you doing? Why are you here? You're here because you want help but you don't know how to talk. You're scared, right? You're afraid of being rejected. You're afraid of being seen in some poor light. Um, a lot of this, when you work with people, they will talk to you about things like low self-esteem. They genuinely believe of, uh, of themselves as inferior. So sort of the opposite of narcissistic personality disorder where they genuinely do believe that they are better than others, despite whatever. This is a person who genuinely believes that they are inferior to others, despite evidence. So you might, you know, notice things about this person, like, hey, you're really, really good at X, Y, Z, and they genuinely do not believe it. And they will find ways to counteract the evidence in the opposite way. You're like, yeah, well, that was just the exception. Or, you know, I just, uh, people think that about me, but it's not true. And I'm afraid people are going to find out that it's not true. Like there's a sort of other extreme of very low self-esteem. Um, you're going to see higher rates of neuroticism here, this belief, um, you know, if you're doing any kind of personality testing, you will see that these folks tend to have more negative affectivity. They tend to assign negative outcomes to things, even if objectively they're not, they will sort of overestimate probability of negative outcomes, all of that stuff. Um, there's a correlation with having first degree relatives that have schizophrenia. And we know that's true for lots of other mental health diagnoses. So take that as you will. They will describe experiences of early rejection. How much of that is actually causal and how much of that is perception? Because by definition, if they have this diagnosis, they perceive rejection. And there's probably a reason it started, right? So it's a chicken or an egg kind of thing, probably both. The treatment is similar to social anxiety, social phobia, lots of CBT, lots of learning, you know, thoughts, counter thoughts, schema, let's actually examine the evidence. You do lots of DBT, especially when it comes to mindfulness, distress tolerance, interpersonal effectiveness. Um, and of course, having a good relationship with your therapist, which really should be there for everything. Um, because if somebody doesn't like you or if you don't like them, which happens, we tend to pathologize not liking people and call it countertransference, even though that's not what countertransference is. You might just not like your client and that's okay because you're a human being. Um, it's not gonna work. You have to have a, a positive relationship and see somebody in a positive regard to do, to do work with them. that you don't like your client, yeah. uh, Do you... it's not a good fit. <laughs> That's always the best way to go forward, right? Because there is a thing, you know, counter-transference is a thing, sure. but a lot of people think that because they're feeling annoyed with a client or this client is provoking them in some way that that's counter-transference. Like, no, that's not what Freud said. And like, that's, that's not, not the same thing. Like, I'll, I'll make you read Freud if you really want to. But yeah, not the same thing. And yeah, you're right. They can just be annoying. Maybe somebody's just a jerk. And you're not treating them for being a jerk. You're treating them for their bipolar. <sighs> you know, it's funny that you brought that book up because I just ordered it recently because a client asked me about it. And the client asked me about it because he has a 17-year-old who's reading it. And I'm like, huh, cool. <laughs> yeah, so I will be reading The Denial of Death soon um, when it arrives. I imagine. Good, cool, yeah. I, um, I recommended him, I said, yes, I will do my homework and read um, Becker and you do your work and watch Little Miss Sunshine 
and tell me if the 17 year old that you're dealing with is the 17 year old in the movie so that I can really understand what's going on here. <laughs> that's great. So we'll see how that, that'll, that's tomorrow. So we'll see how that goes. All right, dependent personality disorder. Come back, you have 10 minutes. I don't have anything to throw, I'm throwing things. It's okay, you're fine. Um, dependent personality disorder. So this is another thing that people tend to kind of overdiagnose based on colloquial language, media, so on and so forth. And it is also still a very real thing. So five or more of the following has difficulty making everyday decisions without an excessive amount of advice and reassurance from others, needs others to assume responsibility for most major areas of his or her life, has difficulty expressing disagreements with others because of the fear of loss or support or approval. Note, do not include realistic fears of retribution. Somebody's projecting, okay, fine. Um, has difficulty initiating projects or doing things on his or her own because of a lack of self-confidence and judgment or abilities rather than a lack of motivation or energy. So not a depressive episode, right? goes to excessive lengths to obtain nurturance and support from others to the point of volunteering to do things that are unpleasant. So the person who is kind of constantly putting others needs first is a people pleaser and they will volunteer to do things that they don't even wanna do. They're not even waiting until they're asked. Um, feels uncomfortable or helpless when alone because of exaggerated fears of being unable to care for himself or herself urgently seeks another relationship as a source of care and support when a close relationship ends. So this is a person who is really not okay with being on their own. And that isn't just romantic relationships, that's friendships, um, family, all of those things. Unrealistically preoccupied with fears of being left to take care of himself or herself. So there's a lot of overlap here um, with something like borderline personality because you're talking about this fear of abandonment. However, the fear of abandonment and borderline personality is all about um, not having that person anymore, not having that closeness anymore. Whereas with dependent personality disorder, it's all about, I don't know how to exist. I don't know how to take care of myself. Um, and it's not just going to be emotional needs. It's going to be in other ways as well. So like I have a client right now who, um, is struggling. And again, I don't know if he meets full, full diagnostic criteria or not, but I see this kind of dependence issue where he brings his wife into therapy with him. And when his wife's not there, he brings his daughter into therapy with him. And I have never spoken to this client on the phone because his family members make his appointments for him and cancel his appointments for him and reschedule his appointments for him. And then I meet the guy and I'm like, okay, cool. Totally like first I'm thinking maybe he's nervous, maybe he's anxious, maybe he doesn't want to talk, maybe he has some kind of like disability or something, he doesn't feel comfortable talking to the phone. Nope, totally talkative, fine, normal. Um, wanted that person there, but would often, if there was an answer he didn't know, or a question he didn't know the answer to, he would turn to the daughter or to the wife and get them to answer for him. And then presents totally fine, daughter gets up to go to the bathroom, instant, just fear, um, like, okay, well, let's keep talking. Let's continue the conversation because she's just here as your support person. Could not do it. Like, no, 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 I need her here. I need her here. I'm like, okay. Um, so maybe there's a dependence there and there's a dependence there to a level that is not considered culturally appropriate, right? If a child did that, that would be different, you know? But this is a grown adult male. So, you know, whether or not you would consider that to be culturally appropriate or developmentally appropriate, all of that kind of stuff. Um, so this can also be a person, um, the phrase that used to be really popular was learned helplessness. Uh, we don't use that a lot anymore, um, cause it's problematic as are most things that we talk about. And you do see that happen. You see this happen sometimes even with may maybe somebody's had some really serious medical issues in the past. And so they are forced to be dependent and then they just don't know how, and then you do some skills training, it gets better. If somebody has this as a diagnosis, though, it's going to be, again, across all domains and even with skills training, it doesn't go, get better or they feel like it's not getting better. So you might present evidence like, hey, you called me yourself today. Like, I really appreciate that. You know, I appreciate that you took the time to do that or I appreciated hearing from you. And they're like, oh, no, no, I can't. I can't. I can't do it. I can't do it. 
Um, so you're going to look at those things and look at is, is this a person objectively incapable? Have they had experiences where they were objectively incapable? And do they still feel that way, despite, you know, the outward behavior? Um, no, we're going to have a conversation about that, <laughs> you know, and that conversation is going to look like, like, hey, you're my client and it's important that you have confidentiality and you're my client. So it's important that you have choice, mm -hmm. you know, so if you really want them in the room, sure, it makes me uncomfortable, but I need to deal with that. That's my problem. And it tells me something, right? We're going to talk about why, or at some point we're going to try to talk about why. I'm also going to be like, hey, blink three times if you're being held hostage. I don't know, <laughs> either him or the daughter or the wife or whoever, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and it becomes like with trauma treatment. Yeah, it, it's, it's troublesome in that particular instance because we're supposed to be doing trauma treatment where so much about that is kind of building insight into internal experience and bodily awareness. And so I'll say things like, what does this feel like in your body? And instead of answering, he'll look at the wife and the wife answers for him. And I'm like, that's not how that works. <laughs> this is the opposite, right? Because you're disconnecting from your body and relying on someone else to make an observation. And that's the opposite of what I'm trying to teach you how to do. So, um, dependent personality disorder, again, issues with attachment. Um, you might see this come up with our case study, Andy because Andy's mom is continuing to do things that maybe aren't great for him and learning to cope with, you know, life's difficulties. Um, and last but not least, obsessive compulsive personality disorder. Um, much like with schizotypal being a, perceived as either a precursor to or a light version of schizophrenia, obsessive compulsive personality disorder can be a precursor to or perceived as OCD light. So the actual criteria in the DSM are preoccupied with details, rules, lists, orders, organization, schedules to the extent that the major point of the activity is lost shows perfectionism that in interferes with task completion. So they're unable to complete a project because their own standards are not being met. Excessively devoted to work and productivity to the exclusion of leisure activities and friendships, also other relationships, right? And not accounted for by economic necessity. So I'm not gonna diagnose somebody that has three jobs because they are poor and they need to have three jobs. Um, this is a person who, and it doesn't just have to be work, right? It can be productivity in general. They are unable to enjoy things unless they are productive. So, okay, I really like to do artwork, but I'm not going to do it unless it's perfect. Or I really like to do writing, but I'm going to do it unless it's perfect. All of those things. And they have this value attached to it. So if it's not perfect, it's worthless. So very black and white in that way. Over conscientious, scrupulous, and inflexible about matters of morality, ethics, or values not accounted for by cultural or religious identification. So again, these really black and white kind of extremes. Unable to discard worn out or worthless objects, even when they have no sentimental value. What does that sound like? Yep. So that's a thing. Reluctant to delegate tasks or to work with others unless they submit to exactly his or her way of doing things. Adopts a miserly spending style toward both self and others. Money is viewed as something to be hoarded for future catastrophes and shows rigidity and stubbornness. These criteria are kind of all over the place. Um, what it really comes down to for OCPD is need for control. And it isn't something, there might be, like a person can be comorbid with narcissistic personality, but if it's just OCPD, they don't want everyone to do things their way because they think that their way is superior. It's because they just can't cope with changes. They can't cope with deviations from the norm. Um, you might also see an overlap here with autism spectrum disorder, but without all of the other things that make autism autism. So you could see this with all kinds of things. You might see this with something like trauma. It could look a lot like hypervigilance. 
every morning she comes into class. Mm -hmm. Her little area, desk area has to be perfectly matching. Mm -hmm. All her little fidgets, all her little pens, papers, everything has to be there. If you go over and touch it or mess with it, yeah. if it's not there, she'll touch it on, get it in order. Even though it'll be messy. Yeah, it's got to be right. It's got to be right. Every day she goes, gets to get her little head of the classroom. She has to take certain things with her. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> But again, it's, you know, a lot of it is that for this, so the person is OCPD, it's like that, but with all the things, yeah. right? With autism, it tends to only be specific things yeah. about the environment um, or specific things about a schedule or a routine. Yeah. Um, whereas with OCPD, it's everything all the time. So again, with personality disorders it is pervasive, is across all domains, and they, um, you know, they're not able to move forward. So you do see a lot of um, similar thought patterns with a lot of other diagnoses, including OCD. What this lacks that OCD has is the compulsive behavior piece. So they might get distressed when things don't go or things aren't done a certain way or they're not done the way that they feel is perfect. Um, but that's the other big difference is that with OCD, it's not about perfection and it's not about the moral value. It's about things just being done in the way that feels correct for them in that moment or a certain way. Same thing with autism. It's less about perfectionism and more about routine and predictability. For this person, it's all about perfection and things being um, under control in that way. So if I'm hearing you right, um, just with clarification, um, so you're saying with uh, OCPD, it's um, having things done the right way, but with OCD, it's like the compulsion to keep your lives? A little bit of both. Um, okay. Yeah, it's this kind of a less extreme version. So like when we talked about OCD, we talked a lot about these compulsory behaviors where the person is specifically doing the behavior to make the intrusive thought go away. But it's about specific things. It's not necessarily global. Whereas with OCPD, it's less extreme, but more global. Okay, that's really helpful. Yeah, so it's like the whole precise versus um, whatever, you know, yeah. the, the bullet analogy thing that I can't remember at the moment. Precision versus, what's the other word? <laughs> so with OCD, they're gonna, there's going to have specific obsessions with specific behaviors that go along with them with OCPD, it's global, but less intense. It's like a slow version. Yeah, works for me. <laughs> so in summary, long-standing patterns of behavior and internal experience. Starts early, goes on throughout the entire life. Nobody can decide how to best categorize personality disorders. And one could argue that a lot of that is because they are very much culturally bound and things that we consider to be outside of normative experience. And not a lot is known about causes or treatment, which we've already talked about the exceptions to that. And, you know, all of the reasons why we may or may not know causes of things because there might not be causes. Or, again, if we are defining something by deviation from the norm, maybe the causes in the definition and not in, you know, some sort of ideological thing. Any questions about personality disorder? Um, there is a video on Canvas that I posted about narcissistic personality disorder. You're not required to watch it, but if you are interested in that particular topic, it's pretty long, it's like 17 minutes, um, but they talk about the different subtypes and all that kind of stuff. And I put it there because, again, it is something that's sort of misunderstood or thrown around a lot. So the more you know. What is it? Okay. Oh my God, you actually made one. That's amazing. I'm excited. Thank you, online people. It's like literally. Thank you. Feel better to my folks that stick you. And for those who stayed home because for whatever reason, hope you're doing okay. Hope you're safe. Stay safe. All that stuff. Send me emails if there are questions about the midterm. I'm 99.9% .9 sure that I added everyone's accommodations to Canvas. If you don't see them, let me know ASAP and I will fix it. Sweet. All right. Have a lovely evening.